as um, the local host, let's put it this way, in a global event, online event, <laughs> sounds a little bit strange, but um, that's how it is nowadays. Um, we, we all have to share the same reality. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy about um, a dream coming true. A um, couple of years ago, um, I somehow realized the fact that um, um, social entrepreneurship is um, identified in a lot of fields, but not, um, not so much in the, in the field of sports. Myself being um, a big fan of um, different sports, um, I thought that this is not really a good situation for all of us. So um, I managed to convince um, our friends in, in MS, um, Lars and um, Daniel, first of all, as chairs of the working group too, um, uh, the fact about the fact that this would be a good opportunity for MS to get involved in promoting um, how social entrepreneurship could um, be reflected in the sport field, how could um, um, empower the community. And luckily enough, um, after a while and a lot of um, discussions, including a general assembly saying, yes, okay, you can do it. Uh, in the end, we, here we are. Um, and again, I'm, I'm more than happy to welcome you all. Um, and I would like to ask um, Rocio as the official uh, representative of EMS uh, to also um, give you the um, greeting uh, for this morning, um, whatever would be evening in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mihai. As, as he said, it's been a long, a long road that we have, you know, walked together or run together uh, in the last in the last uh, years to make this a reality and indeed you know for those of you who are not familiar with the mess um, we have been building teams and we have been building communities for over 20 years now uh, and it is true that that for us who are committed to to uh, studying what we call the SE field that incorporates social enterprise and social entrepreneurship social and solidarity economy and even social innovation it is also, it is now that we realize that in many cases we have been at the forefront, really uh, uh, opening new, new avenues for research uh, with regards to social, uh, to this SE field. And, and in this uh, precise moment, in this occasion, we have been able to do it in the framework of what is called the Empower SE Cost Action. And this is um, a scheme, a finance scheme that, that exists here in Europe and that allows researchers to, to get in touch with each other, to network around topics that are uh, collectively decided and around activities that are also collectively uh, decided. And there's a specific focus on, on um, supporting early career researchers, uh, also countries where a research community is not consolidated yet, and then also women. So, uh, I mean, those three, groups are, are certainly recognized as, as very important. As, as we, as, as I was saying, you know, it's been, it's been over uh, 20 years that we have been trying to build a community. I mean, we are formally a network, but the idea is that we started as a European network that then expanded uh, worldwide. And, and we see now sort of the collective market that we have been able to, to achieve. For me, I mean, we have been doing this in various fields, as, as Mihai was saying, working group two is one of the four working five, but I mean, four effectively for research uh, that, in, that are included in Empower AC. And this one, working group two, um, concerns itself with new industries. It's what we call new industries, precisely aiming at identifying fields that are very promising for future uh, research. So. Uh, when we talked about sports, you know, I, I think that one of the um, ideas that really resonates is that few things in this world really capture the idea of a group of people working towards a, a shared goal uh, uh, than team. I mean, I, I think that that was one of the things that really that I was really inspired by. So from from a, an SE perspective, when we speak about communities, there is a sense of acting together for the common good. That resonates, that resonates so well 
with this new field of inquiry that we're open today in the framework of, of this seminar. For me, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to be a part of this uh, research. Uh, and precisely because I think that uh, in this year, this year there has been a huge challenge for many of us, as Anne was saying before, in many cases, cities, you know, for, for many months of lockdown, uh, rural areas also totally isolated, despite, you know, the, the ideally a better uh, context for them to be in. I think that one of the things that we have also learned in this year, in these months, has been that thanks to uh, the contact and thanks to the physical activity that we have been able to 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 take on, we have been kept away, or he, it has helped us uh, stay away from from insanity. And also, it has given us a sense of connectedness with with other human beings uh, while in a situation of lockdown. So, for us, casting light on, on the transform on this transforming phenomenon uh, that we call sports and that we connect with, uh, with the sense of community, with communities around the world, is really the, the aim of today's workshop. Our idea, as I was saying, is that we are just opening, that we are just beginning a, a collective uh, run, a collective uh, a journey, and that it will take us um, far, actually. Before moving on and just giving the floor back to, to Danielle, uh, I would like to thank them, both of them, Mihai and uh, Daniel, for the work they have put uh, into this. Then also for, you know, this, this workshop was aimed and, and was designed as a, as a presential, you know, as a physical uh, meeting in Romania. So we had to, to work and really, really against the, the clock to make this happen today uh, digitally. So I really uh, would like to thank them for, for playing as such uh, amazing uh, teammates. So that's all for now. Off to you, Danielle, and looking forward to today's workshop. Um, just, just a short notice before, Danielle, um, an administrative issue. I would like you to um, write your names and country and put them in the chat um, as we develop um, the, the event, just to have a... We know that there are people from a lot of countries, but we would like to have a more specific um, inventory um, as we uh, go. <laughs> Daniel? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, thank you Rocio. So, I will, I will continue on these words and um, introduce to you first part of the, of the program, which is Roundtable, named Sports as a Community Builder, Social Enterprise, Social Entrepreneurship is Sports. It's also overall theme of our, our research workshop. As uh, Brossi already said it, this roundtable and this workshop is part of Empower SE Cost Action, which is in European terms, one of the most significant tools for research to network and to explore, explore new, new issues. And this workshop, uh, this workshop particularly is part of working group two, which is called uh, Industries and Impact, which is especially focused to address existing fragmentation uh, in the levels of knowledge regarding social enterprises in different fields, but also to start and spark an interest in the new fields of, the, of development of social entrepreneurship. So just for, uh, for example, till now we have several, uh, several different workshops on different topics. One of them was uh, um, migration. It was held in Trento, Trento, Italy, and it was one of the first international um, efforts to to tackle this new uh, new issue and to talk about importance of social entrepreneurship in the migration field. One was related to more classical uh, habit of uh, so social enterprises, the health and social services, and one was related to uh, arts and culture, which, was, which is also a relatively unexplored area uh, of social entrepreneurship. Uh, this one, as we already, already mentioned, uh, have a focus on sports. And sports, uh, as Rocio said, and we are all aware of it, has a great ability to, to influence uh, community cohesion, to influence physical and mental health, uh, to be to, to foster so, social inclusion and 
provide a positive positive role model uh, role across the society and we think that the sports as a as a tool to tackle social community problems has a huge but very untapped potential in social entrepreneurship area so this this is the key issue on uh, which will we will form our round table today so we will explore basically two two critical issues what one uh, how how our social enterprises in sports develop and what their uh, social and community impact and second second issue related to state of the art uh, of the research and research field of social entrepreneurship in sport so i think that we have interesting discussion uh, in front of us it's one of the first of this kind which is particularly uh, pleasing pleasing for the cost action for our us as participants and the development of the area and uh, today uh, we have with us four people uh, who will uh, who will participate in this this round table there are people who, who are investigating a research in social entrepreneurship in sports which are starting social uh, change initiatives uh, in this area and i'm very uh, very ple ple pleased to welcome uh, them all I, I will state them as as they mentioned uh, in program. So we have uh, Mike Bull from uh, Manchester Metropolitan U University Business School, uh, United United Kingdom. Hey, Mike. Hi, everybody. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have Anne Bandi Berus uh, from School School of Population and Health, University of New Wales, uh, New South Wales, South Wales, Australia. Hello, Anne. Hey everybody. Uh, we have uh, Lars Ulan Cobro from uh, Center of Social Entrepreneurship and Social Innovation, University of South Eastern Norway. Hi Lars. Hi everybody. Hi. Thank you. And uh, we have Monica Stanescu from National University of C uh, Physical Education and Sports from Bucharest, uh, Romania. Hello, Monica. Yeah. Ah. Hi, and thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you all for uh, for participating in this roundtable and uh, for the discussion that that, that we follow. So, uh, basically, I will I will ask you a, a several several interconnected interconnected question, and. Uh, we want to hear your insights, your thoughts about about this field. Uh, just a small reminder for the participants: you can pose a, pose the questions uh, questions in in chat or in this reaction uh, section of the Zoom. You can raise hands if you have something to something to uh, to tell us or something to ask uh, our our part participants. Uh, so we, we will start. Uh, sport as a as a community builder is a is a title of our of our of our workshop. So we want to look more closely to social enterprises and social entrepreneurship in sports. For the beginning, just just to warm up, let's say I I would like to ask you all, and maybe you can uh, you can answer by the order that I uh, that I presented you. Uh, from your experience, or from your research, from your discipline, or, or maybe from your ge geographical area, uh, what do you think? How, what are the aspects? How can social enterprises contribute to community building or achieving wider social impact? So I will ask Mike uh, first, then and then Lars and Monica. Okay, thank you. I was making some notes last night and I was I was trying to sort of divide up and think about how how I could kind of map this out and present this and I was thinking that there's the organizational level um, when we think about different types of social enterprise so in my own work with Rory Ridley Duff we define three different types of social enterprise the uh, charitable version a cooperative version and an entrepreneur-led social business version. And what I was thinking about those three different types, in terms of the charity, 
I guess in sport, we've got most of those organizations that are delivering charitable purposes as part of their sort of community outreach and very sort of grassroots organizations that are working on health and well-being and all of those types of issues. Then maybe in terms of the sort of the, the mutual ownership and the cooperative, we maybe have got supporter ownership type models. Certainly in football, there are the supporter ownership type models. Um, and some of those are sort of seen as the sort of the, the mainstream in, in, in Germany, for example, but then they are the alternative in the UK. Um, and then there is the, the third element, which is the sort of the trading um, type social enterprise that uses sport as the vehicle to engage, but to trade and to, um, to have that sort of exchange of, of, um, of money there. So I'm thinking of some examples here of, um, we've got companies like Street League in the UK and the Homeless World Cup, which goes across the world now. Um, these are organizations that are driven by their sort of charitable purpose. Um, and then we've got football clubs um, that are cooperative owned in the UK. We've got um, FC United, which I'll come on to in, in one of my presentations today. Um, and, and then the more, the more trading side of, um, of organizations that um, uh, use football as their vehicle to trade so so the, so the different types I was thinking about well there's there's social capital involved in this as well and I'm thinking that there's there's crown green bowling clubs that we have in the UK uh, darts teams uh, snooker clubs there's all manner of kind of like fringe sports as well as the main sort of activity out there on the field sports that we sort of think about in in that kind of sense um, and then there's maybe if there's avenues for research um, one of my papers today will be talking about mission drift but there's also um, notions of kind of volunteering um, there's um, aspects of fans as social innovators um and then of course recently probably on the press that you may have caught is that supporter owned wrexham football club in wales has um has just sold itself out to to hollywood actors mm. so there's all sorts of tensions that exist around the sort of the fringes um of a lot of the movement which um you know which is really quite kind of interesting and could be a good research avenue. I'll leave it there for now. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mike. And what are what are your thoughts? Oh, I have so many. I don't know where to begin, but I'll try to tail on Michael's um, introduction. So I think, well, first of all, my focus on sports is um, the area of sport for good. So it's probably linked to what Michael's referring to as the charitable aspect, although we don't really think of it as that, we more think of it as positive social change through sports. Um, and my own work has been in football. It started out not in a social entrepreneurship area at all, it more as an avenue to help refugee youth and families uh, feel welcome in Australia through football, the global game. Um, and build into first getting experienced and working a lot and using football for positive social change, not just in Australia, but internationally. So I'm also on the board of an international organization, some of you may know called Street Football World, um, which is an international network of organizations using football for positive social change uh, in, in a whole variety of ways. And my own, um, sort of journey into social enterprise came out of our challenges to keep our programs alive financially so that we could keep our programs alive for the good that they're doing. And um, I'm sure you're all aware of the fickleness of funding across the world in any kind of a charitable or um, social good entity. 
So um, we set up a social enterprise to survive, basically. And from there, um, when I was elected to the Board of Street Football World, I made that my mission to work with the members to help them survive, thrive um, in a financial way so that they could keep doing the work they were doing. And the fact that my work um, emanated from my doctoral study um, was such that I'm based in a university. So I had to build research into what I was doing to keep it going. That was a good thing. Um, it was challenging, but it was a good thing because it made me look at things much more closely. And um, so I actually, unfortunately, she can't join us today, but I have a phenomenal PhD student looking specifically at this area of social enterprise. And one of the things that we're seeing is social enterprise, of course, as you all know, is a very diverse um, terminology. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. It means a lot of things to a lot of organizations. As does, we're starting to find this whole concept of sustainability. What does this mean? And in our collective world, looking at social enterprise and social innovation, sustainability means something very different, for example, than um, the environment and environmental sustainability. So we're now working on a framework that takes this idea of sustainability and looks at it across all the different elements. And um, it's very exciting stuff, I'd love to share it with you, but back to the whole social entrepreneurship or social enterprise, that in and of itself is very diverse. It ranges from everything to organizations creating goods to sell, to then enable their uh, work to continue. It ranges from um, uh, selling services, um, a whole variety of things. And it's very, very rich, but it's also therefore very complex, I guess. And um, one of the really exciting activities I'm involved with is a thing called, uh, a movement now called Common Goal. It started out with us looking towards engaging football, you know, one of the, the biggest money-making entities in sports in the entire globe, and trying to get football to take its responsibility socially to give back. And um, it started out with the idea of a 1% engagement of football players, revenue, their, their revenue, to the Common Goal Foundation, which is then channeled through a process of um, calls for expressions of interest and uh, assessment of programs to be able to benefit from this 1% uh, funding to keep going. Um, it's been an exciting journey. It's very new. It's, it was launched in 2017 from some very key football stars. Um, we've seen footballers across the world pledge 1% of their salary to the Common Goal Fund, but it's gone well beyond that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the CEO of UEFA has given 1% of his salary to Common Goal Fund. We've got agents giving funding now. We've got football clubs. Um, there's actually a football club in Denmark who has given 1% of its uh, overall profits to the Common Goal Foundation. And it's, um, I, I'd really like to be able to get everybody's contact details, if that's okay, to keep you up to date on this, because the movement is going to be growing. We've got a very ambitious goal for 2030 um, to bring people um, together through a, the Common Goal community to enable people who are working in this way to connect, to build, to share, to um, thrive together. Um, there will be obviously uh, a whole research angle uh, added on to that. Um, the whole idea is just to bring people together to help move this area of sport for good forward through a social innovation and social enterprise uh, approach. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm happy to tell you more. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Anne, and we are happy to hear more. Uh, we will definitely share the contacts among each other to 
to inform us of this initiative as, and, and of course to possibly foster the interest of other other people to join to uh, to help and to participate in this uh, this positive positive example and I think it's a it's a great example how you know you can galvanize social responsibility and galvanize solidarity across the across the society. Uh, next uh, we have Lars Lars what are your input thoughts on this first question? You need to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, interesting. Thank you, Michael and uh, Anna. Um, I obviously also thought about what angle I should uh, address this theme uh, in. And, and uh, I think I will choose a more uh, sociological or, or even cultural uh, perspective uh, out of what I've seen and, and one answer on the question if uh, it's it if it's like we read in the program that uh, that it is not so much contact and so much <coughs> reflections on on sport according to social enterprise and social innovation and my answer on that is no there are, are surprisingly little connection between the 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 the, the conventional sport community and uh, the academic field of social enterprise and social innovation if that is a community or a field well it is obviously we are the other head discussed that so why is there a little academic reflections then on innovation and entrepreneurship in the world of sports and in the academic literature if that's right I would, I would like to comment on this by retelling a short story. Actually, it's a beautiful story about a, a milliped that every morning delighted all the animals in the forest with its incredibly graceful and dazzling dance. Everybody admired the scene. They gathered in small groups after the happening each morning, drinking from the morning dew, sharing their impressions and admira admirations for the millipeds dance, everyone, everyone, but one, the frog. One morning, he went to the milliped and said, since I'm a great admirer of your dancing skills, there is something I need to clarify. When you are going to put down your foot number thousand, do you that at the same time when you lift foot number 999, or, or do you lift it at the same time before, or maybe a little after? And, and why, dear milliped, do you bend your front part to the right just when you lift your head in that particular way that you do? It went exactly as the frog intended. When the milliped was forced to think through what she was actually doing, she was confused. And when she was about to perform her dance the next morning, everything stumbled. According to the fable, to the, the story, the, ne the, the ne milliped never danced again. So, who is the milliped and who is the frog? I don't know, but what I'm, I do know is that big parts of the sport community does beautiful things in arenas, in football pitches, and in sporting halls, also regarding social value and outcome, without really reflecting explicit on questions like how, why, who, and when, it just seems quite often to do the right things. So maybe the scenery where academia and, and practice meets its other, that's a meeting between two cultures, the pondering critical frog and the intuitive life celebrating my milliped. My mandate is not to answer, my obligation is just to raise some questions for debates. And my experience or our experience from the 
University of Southeast Norway is that at least what we are studying, we have been studying what is called street football, but it's actually not going on in the streets. It's not this homeless football that was mentioned by Mike. It's a, a, a program going on in conventional top elite football clubs in the three top divisions of the Norwegian Football League. And they are recruiting and mobilizing players with substance abuse and mental health issues and making training and, 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 and clubs and, and tournaments for, for those. Uh, but they are including them in the conventional facilities and, and program in, the, in these clubs. They are playing with uh, ordinary suits, uh, using the same training facilities as the uh, elite cl uh, club players. Meet the elite club players, eating lunch together with them or breakfast together with them. So and, and it has some impressive outcome. I will talk about this in my lecture at one o'clock this afternoon. But the, our experience is that these clubs are not reflecting on why and how and and when and who they are working. They are just doing the right things. Often the right things, not always, but mostly. And when we interview them and, and, and do our research, then they are maybe, they are like the milliped. They stop doing it because they are start to think and analyze what they are really doing. Anyway, it's two culture meeting and maybe we should work on that meeting point, recruiting people from each other's community, developing a, a common language more than an academic language on the, in the old, in the own one, one more or less planet and then all the actually working on the right place and way in the other planet maybe we should work with more common planets well you know what i mean Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Lars. And I think that we will also uh, connect to these issues how to foster meeting of these two two cultures uh, also la later in the discussion. Uh, now I will uh, give give a floor to Monica uh, for for her first reflections. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation. It seems that now we are uh, two networks in the same workshop because here uh, we are uh, with our very good friend, Maxim uh, from Norway. Hello, Maxim. So uh, Maxim is a leader in two projects, Erasmus Platz projects, designed to promote social innovation and social entrepreneurship in this relation with sports. So, um, we as a university are connected to this topic thanks to them and thank you maxim for this idea because um, we had the opportunity to put in a new theoretical and a practical uh, framework some initiative that uh, we already developed during the years and now um, i want to present you some uh, perspective from this academic Part because here in Romania we have uh, a lot of initiatives that try to help people, especially from disadvantaged group, to take part in this uh, sport phenomenon by practicing different sports branches. So uh, we had a special we have a special care on the people with uh, disabilities and uh, usually uh, our teachers and students participate 
uh, participate are participating as volunteers in many actions uh, during um, during the holidays but also during uh, the year for example we have um, every week and every holiday projects with uh, people with down syndrome but also uh, with uh, motor disabilities that usually take part in uh, different uh, sports branches activities as dancing football or um, bocce maybe you know there are special sports branches that we try to promoting among them in the same time we try to stay very close to other phenomenon for example how to use sport to integrate children with uh, from uh, disadvantaged groups and uh, we also promote some initiatives for uh, people in different uh, region of romania and uh, this big project project is uh, now developed with um, University of uh, Oslo Sports School. Sports. Um, it's a school of high uh, no, high school of sports from Norway, it's Oslo. Maybe you know them. And uh, they are partners in this project. And uh, we try to promote some uh, models of good practice on how to use physical exercise, physical exercises to improve their their quality of life. Of course, we are, we, we are interested also in other topics. For example, now um, we just start to collaborate in an uh, e-cost network on the topic of elderly people and how can we, how can we help them to improve their quality of life by practicing different um, physical activities. So uh, we try because we are conscious of we are we are aware that uh, the relation between uh, academic and uh, social uh, issues are not always very strong. We try to overpass this um, gap and uh, we we try to find the best solution to cooperate with them. In the same time, uh, we also try to promote this uh, knowledge in uh, academic because uh, in Romania we are not so many people involved in researches on this, on this topic. And um, of course, we will be very grateful if we can join your interests and activities in order to to support, to sustain all, this, um, all these activities. Um, especially, and this is because, especially here in Romania, so when we, when we speak about uh, social entrepreneurship, we also speak about social innovation. And uh, it seems that is a bad trend, bad trend, using social, or applying social innovation um, quite late. So we are not uh, very fast in applying good ideas, but I'm sure uh, we can change this also in the field of sports. So these are a few thoughts. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, I'll be very glad to answer. Thank you. Thank, 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 you, Moni thank you, Monica. And uh, we, we will continue uh, and uh, with our discussion on, on the different aspects of social entrepreneurship in sports. But just before that, uh, I want to draw your attention that uh, Mikhail has sent a small questionnaire uh, in the chat. So uh, participants who are not in, in, in round, round table are invited to, um, to fulfill it. It's a very short survey, which will give us also some overview about your thoughts uh, on the field and also uh, help us later to frame this this research research area. Uh, also, if anybody uh, wants to ask something specifically, uh, you can also join and ask uh, questions in the chat. As and as I already said, uh, you can uh, raise a uh, raise a hand in um, in a, in a Zoom option. 
so we will uh, we will give you a word uh, to to continue and to build on your uh, your thoughts and your examples of uh, how social entrepreneurship can can create um, so positive positive social impact i i would would uh, i would like to ask you about uh, value creation uh, process so uh, usually in social entrepreneurship profit profit is used not not as a profit itself but as a means to uh, achieve some social goals and in social entrepreneurship in sports in a way we can say that sports is also used as a means to achieve something not as a as a as an end goal so my uh, my question is what are and what are your thoughts about the process of value creation in sports social enterprises is it similar or is it different from other social enterprises or other uh, third sector organizations that is that is one thing and other thing that i want you to reflect on uh, can and how sports can be a vehicle of innovation in doing social good especially given that sport is very per- permissive in a way than different categories of people of different ages abilities and gender uh, are able to participate so first first question is related to process of value creation is it different and is it uh, the same as other other social social enterprises or other third sector organizations in the, in uh, different areas and second about how can sports be a vehicle for uh, social innovation in doing social good so once again i will ask uh, first Mike and then Anne and then Lars and Monica to reflect on this. So Mike, I give you. Thanks. Um, I guess, well, I'll, I'll address the first question around uh, value. Um, and I kind of, it, it, this is my paper this afternoon really is all about the creation of value because um, sport, whether it's privately owned, or whether it's socially owned, it's it creates value. And my paper talks about really the the difference of a value from different perspectives from fans as the the key stakeholder and owners, the entrepreneurs that that own football clubs in the context that I'm talking about this afternoon. But the the co-creation of value that comes through sport, whether it's privately owned or in social enterprise, is a a very different industry to to any other, I think. And therefore, I think working at the sort of the fringes of whether it's social entrepreneurship, it's certainly social innovation, whether we can sort of um, say that it's kind of constituted as a social enterprise, but organizations that work in the sport industry, certainly at that sort of engagement level, um, there's a co-creation of value. And I think there's some really interesting questions for research in that kind of co-creation, co-production kind of area. I guess, you know, I was, I'll let the rest speak for now. Okay, okay thank, thank you, Mike. Lars? Oh, no, Anne, Anne, please, sorry. Um, I would agree, but disagree. Um, I think that when you're talking about value, um, I think those that want to see a social uh, contribution or social change through sport uh, have a different value set than those that want to create a winning sporting team or league or whatever. And I think that um, I, I love the millipede frog um, story because, and I'm not sure I agree that, um, anyway. I think that um, we are seeing a movement now of, uh, of people and organizations who are trying to do what you're talking about, Michael, 
this co-creation of shared value and value for good. But I think I think this movement needs uh, a lot of a lot of help, a lot of energy. Um, I think we've seen sports across the world in the in this professional area going way too far as we have in many areas um, um, against the personal social values and more towards more towards the um, how would you say it the um, personal gain type of element within that whole so that kind of bridges into the second thing that you asked, Danielle, which is sport can be divisive, just like almost anything, not inherently necessarily bad. It is bad when it becomes violent. Sports, because of the passion it evokes and because of the fact that there's a winner and a loser, um, can be inherent in, inherently divisive or it can bring people together. And um, in the area of sport for good, those people and organizations working in sport for good try to focus the mechanisms on the common good, therefore the common value, the positive value. And it's purposefully done. And this is what differentiates sport for good elements. And Michael, you mentioned Street League. I'm a huge fan. They were one of the organizations I worked with in the very beginning. Um, so the whole idea behind Sport for Good is that it, it focuses firstly on the good and the inherent divisiveness of competition is, um, it, it, we try to minimize that. Um, and that's whether it's in a match or whether it's in all the different mechanisms that people use in the area of Sport for Good. So if you bring this together, with a social entrepreneurship then you're also focusing the entrepreneurship on the good and the benefit for a wider group than just a few individuals and um it, it, it's a challenge but the more that we see it happening the more we see it can happen and the social entrepreneurship efforts can be focused to maximize the good. It sounds maybe Girl Scouty. Uh, I'm sorry if it does, but you, I think you get where I'm going with this. It's purposeful. It's organized in a specific way. And um, that example of the, the football groups working for, um, working with um, different abilities, I don't believe that they were necessarily not knowing what they were doing. Maybe it wasn't orchestrated, maybe it wasn't strategically designed, but, but they knew that in working with these vulnerable populations, they were doing good. And um, this is where it all is, and this is where um, I'm much more a practitioner than an academic, by the way. They call me a pracademic. Um, so my, my heart is in the doing more than the writing up and analyzing. But, you know, you, there's, there's benefit in all of that analysis, of course. Um, but the more that we do learn about the mechanisms and share them widely across different platforms, the more we're going to orchestrate change i'll stop thank, there yeah uh, thank th thank you Anne. and yeah i think there's a there's a difference in looking at sports uh sports as a mean uh, and mechanisms of, of achieving social goal and also sports as a possible value social goal uh, as itself and there's de definitely a difference also in a uh, types of organizations and type of initiatives and that also relates to mechanisms of how they are working and try to achieve social goals, especially when we look at uh, local grassroots initiatives or sports as a global phenomenon or professional clubs are their, their uh, type of their types of initiatives. Uh, okay, uh, I will give uh, next uh, word to Lars.
Yes, thank you. And thank you, Anne, for uh, challenging my story. Um, because I, I, I'm actually sorry, also... Sorry, Klaus, I, I really loved it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I didn't like no, it, no, but... No. I'm, I'm, I'm small, smiling all over, so please, thank you. Uh, I'm also actually a pracademic. Thank you for that uh, term. That's new for me, because I'm a, actually a football player, or used to be, on quite high level, I have to tell you. Uh, and, and while building up or, or entering the academic field, and at the same time being a football player uh, five days a week and matches and tournaments during the weekend, I had no feeling or experience that those two worlds were interconnected. Uh, and of course, we, we know the, the, the term tactic knowledge. We, we know that they know, probably know what they're doing. But I have been interviewing uh, 51 uh, coaches uh, and players and asked them to express why are you doing it this way? And they look so with, with the strangest face and, and, and they are not able to give a, an, an answer that w what, what I would consider as a, a legitimate answer. They are talking uh, to left and to the right and, and try to, to a kind of helping me find the words because they, don't, they haven't been thinking about this explicit in that way before. But let me return to, to the, the question for this, this round. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, what value uh, does it come out of this sport and social enterprise, social innovation? It's hard to answer without taking really t taking um, a depth, uh, a dive depth into the context because it's, from my point of view, it's almost impossible to answer that kind of questions without taking uh, the, the context in considerations. Because the, I have been working international enough to understand that the Norwegian welfare model and the, the, the context for making values, economic values, if so, and, and social values out of football or any kind of sport is quite different in, in Norway as it is in Portugal or Romania or Australia for that case. So I, I, I really can't answer that question without being narrow-minded and, 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 and describe and sketch out what I have been seeing and my research colleagues have been found in the Norwegian football and municipality context where we have done our study. And what we see is that there are very few or little, and, and uh, uh, maybe Monica and Maxim, from their point of view and their project, can can supply this with some other perspectives. But from what our studies and our point of view, we don't see any clear social enterprise emerging in the sport fields in Norway, at least. But we are seeing a lot of social innovation. And we are seeing a lot of very interesting co-productive social innovation. When the first street football team in the con conventional uh, ordinary football club in Norway started in 2011 in Fredrikstad Football Club, it started like this. The coach, which was a, a, a former elite quite famous elite player on Fredrikstad Football Club, brought his paper, invited some boys and two girls with uh, substance abuse, substance uh, abuse and, and mental health uh, issues to the club and said, let's, let's, let's 
make a team, a football team. Let's start playing football together two days a week. And maybe some other clubs can do the same and, and we can meet up in matches. And he put a, t a paper on the table and said, please, let's decide together what kind of rules this club, this team shall have. Uh, and the discussion arise, do we need to be sober? Do we need to quit uh, our substance abuse? Do, do we need to go to uh, recover institutions before uh, entering the teams? So a uh, lot of very significant questions and discussions arise around the table together. And this has developed and now this street football teams in this clubs of Norway, 21 actually at the present time, are making a lot of risk recovery social values for the actual the, the, the involved uh, boys and girls in these teams. So obviously they are making lots of values, social values, but they need, uh, they don't make any money. Uh, on the contrary, they are spending a lot of money for these clubs, so they need to be supported financially from the Norwegian state for the, the health department. So that's the situation. I'll leave it to that. Okay, Th thank you, Lars. And I think really what you reflected on uh, co-creation co and co-production, it's usually a very, very important case for achieving achieving uh, some relevant social goals especially social inclusion of different groups when we are applying these principles from the start of uh, start of organization um i will give uh, a word uh, to monica uh, next next thank you daniel so uh, speaking about values creation in social entrepreneurship i think uh, we can uh, speak about um, of course, positive values at individual level, but also at the group level. And uh, at individual level, I, um, I think we can find some values in uh, physical development level, because here, so I mean, the people from disadvantaged group, people with uh, limited abilities or elderly people can have uh, huge benefits by practicing physical education on the health level, on um, their development, speaking about children. So um, practicing physical exercises or different sports branches, I think we can uh, bring some um, a physical value to these people. From another perspective, I think uh, we can find some uh, psychological values because all the participants can uh, have a huge can have huge benefits on their personal development level as communicator or um, at the level at the level of uh, um, working group skills or um, inclusion tolerance and so on so we can we can develop and we can uh, transfer all these uh, values from uh, our practice field to their personal development and then they can transfer all these achievements in their day-by-day -day life or in their professional life. It depends on the case. Of course, there are some social values because, um, for example, if we work with, uh, peop with children from this, um, poor region or from this uh, disadvantaged communities, we, we observe that uh, they can have a totally change in their um, perspective on the life. So they can build their dreams on new basis by knowing what are the benefits, which are the benefits of physical exercises. 
by uh, meeting um, different uh, athletes and uh, offer them that who offer them model social models and encourage them to to develop themselves of course all these children gain in um, this um, self esteem and uh, try to go outside their situation or their uh, limits so this is from individual so some values of course we can find at the group level it's quite difficult to change the perspective on uh, these uh, poor communities but uh, we have some uh, good example in uh, this roma population or in um, also refugees because um, by practicing sports of course they can meet um, the cultural values in this in each countries and i hope that uh, all this discussion these days about some races in romania will be stopped because we are not uh, like this but uh, unfortunately some uh, words or so, some comments sometimes are misunderstood understood and of course um, I think uh, by this social entrepreneurship we can change the perception at the um, population level so we can uh, we can have this opportunity to see that uh, all the all the nations practicing sports have a more open mind perception on life on relations so usually they have a good life quality and usually they uh, they see any challenges as an opportunity to develop to develop themselves so i think this uh, value creation could be very important and uh, I think by this perspective, we as a sports specialist can, uh, can achieve this uh, trust. We can, uh, we can have the trust, we can be trustful for all this population that we addressed. Yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good point to create this value. And, uh, but of course, we have to be very careful because we can analyze the values creation from the negative part because all this all the people even in social uh, um, entrepreneurship uh, activities can find some uh, or can meet some negative part of sports and here we have look um, violence races or um, why not um, harassment or um, drug abuse or so on so we have to be very careful when we speak about this uh, value creation because uh, vulnerable people um, coming in sports can meet also these uh, bad parts and we have to be very careful how we can transfer the positive value to them thank you Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. As we are uh, 20 minutes from the end of the, our discussion, I will move forward to the next issues that were somewhat raised in the discussion already, but they are also raised in comments by the question of uh, Daniela uh, Conti from Italian Sports for All uh, organization. So we can say in a way that sports as a field of social entrepreneurship has part of very little interest in academic literature. We, we don't see it on the conferences, for example, EMS conferences or ISTR conferences. You have maybe one or two, one or two presentations uh, on it. Uh, we didn't saw it reflected much in a big map, mapping exercise of social entrepreneurship ecosystems in Europe. But on the other hand, you witness and we so um, we we see in the communities a lot of examples of social entrepreneurship uh, in sports. We also see, for example, tens or hundreds of Erasmus Plus programs uh, for international collaborative partnership that are relatively close or similar or are social 
social enterprises. Uh, so this is regarding the visibility uh, and doing research in the sector. But we also uh, mentioned the issues how to connect. So how to connect academic community, how to con con uh, connect uh, practitioners. And uh, uh, this, st this uh, work by academics also came to mind in other different areas of social entrepreneurship and people are doing research, but also doing practice, uh, practice in the field. And I, I want to reflect on, on the comment that Daniela can, con, uh, Conti made that, uh, that it should be necessary that universities and sports organization, I will read it, work together in a more connected, uh, connected uh, uh, way in a relationship of mutual respect. So, and some academic study, study area, uh, studies this area just as a speculative eye with an idea that there are processes of a theory, on the contrary, on grassroots associations, there are idea that only who work in the in the grounds really knows everything about the uh, about the matter. So there's a there's an issue of dualism from academic point of view and uh, practice uh, practitioners uh, po po point of view. And of course, from academic point of view, you can study sports from different different fields, and it's very un interdisciplinary field, for example, economics, sociology, physiology, public health, and uh, so forth. My question for, for you is how to uh, connect academics and practitioners to give uh, more precise research on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, to help uh, practitioners with valuable data, data to develop their initiatives uh, that is that is a, a general issue. So how to how to connect these two uh, two communities, and also how to potentially foster further research in this area, which is relatively under research so far. So in the same dire same same direction of participants. So how to foster communication of of these two communities, and what are some aspects how to foster further research interest in this topic of social entrepreneurship in sports. So once again, I will give a first word, uh, uh, word to Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess there's, there's, there is, as our university within the sports department that we have um, within the business school, um, there is a big connection between our university and Manchester City. And there are all sorts of volunteering um, initiatives and things like that around that side. But I work at a business school and interestingly, on one of um, the programmes that I run is a, uh, a master's in business where we, we largely have um, three of the four years of the study where students engage in a consultancy business that works very much with the community side of businesses. So. Um, we have an awful lot of projects where students work with social enterprises. And one of the areas, um, I'm, I'm a junior football club manager and um, have a number of projects each year from my students that work with my football club. Um, so we've had, um, from the business side of things, as a business consultancy kind of thing, is that we work on things like a social media campaign. We do an exploration into funding in order to develop the football club. Um, one group looked into the feasibility of starting um, a women's football team and that has gone from strength to strength. And, and so this is the kind of engagement from the business school angle. But I know in sociology, there's an awful lot of, um, of academics in sport that are engaging in a more sociological way. I mean, we've got big connections with FC United of Manchester was actually one or two of the academics that um, that are in the sociology department actually started that football club up. Um, you know, so I think, and then, 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 there's, then there's education department um, who work with um, a street level kind of like, you know, sport engagement packages. So, the, you know, there's an awful lot going on in different faculty areas of the university um, it's a pity it doesn't all come together and it doesn't do that 
it's all very splintered because there's all sorts of different uh, interest groups involved in this kind of thing but um, it's interesting that sort of engagement from the university and the outside world which i do see as happening quite a lot certainly in my own university thank you mike Lars? no and sorry hi uh, once again confusing and it's okay it doesn't matter what order we go in actually um i i agree with michael and i was raising my hand because i was going to say absolutely that i don't think it's difficult and i think it's happening in in areas where it's not happening maybe um we can help like michael just did give suggestions of how to make this happen this connect um i i think to me the bigger question is what 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 for do we want to document this to document it do we want to document this to see changes and if we do what are the changes and if we hone in because we're we're dancing here between this the sport for good or the good that sport can bring and all the benefits and monica you spoke of many 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 of them um or are we honing in on social enterprise or are we honing in on the nexus of the two and i i, I think what's the purpose um for us the purpose was it started out as i said by by survival um one of the th reasons i'm really passionate about the whole idea of social business is because i was fortunate enough to spend some time with professor Yunus, the nobel prize winner in his social business philosophy and for me personally and the work we do i see it as a vehicle um, which goes hand in hand with the social good that we're looking to do with the sports which is changing the mindset of how people look at this world and how people navigate this world and if we can be um well one there's a practical very practical um situation which is if we can set up some social entrepreneurship within our sporting and sport for good initiatives we can enable them to keep going and therefore we can keep doing more and more good um but it's also a mindset if the if the people involved in our programs whether they be the coaches you're talking about Laos, or whether they're the participants that monica is talking about or all if we can be fostering a philosophy of life and a philosophy of economics, which is different than what has been bulldozed across the world, thanks largely to the Americans, which is one of profit and exploitation, then we are making a fundamental change in the world structure. And I think for me, that's where we we are trying to go with this. And every single participant who even gets a glimpse of this as monica had said um can be carrying that forward so the fundamental question is first of all what is the purpose exchange is good because we learn but if it's only for learning and not making an impact then it can sit in a book or on a shelf or something whereas if the change is for an impact and it can be rolling out um that is i think what it's all about i i definitely agree with you so it's it's about exploring and learning but but using the learned stuff for the engagement and evoking some, some further positive social social changes so uh lars you have a yes <laughs> thank you well i i, I think I, I will as a uh, as a, a, a critical researcher as we wish well ought to be uh, see see these uh, questions from two angles uh, both quite critical uh, when we studied the, the the street football project in norway uh, we we were seven researchers uh, four uh, professors and researchers from the university and three players actually with their own life experience as you know with this 
drug abuse issues. Uh, we obviously did that because we thought it was wise and we uh, actually also in the University of Southeastern Norway has this philosophy and, and, and we are building up a praxis using co-researchers in our social research field. But it's difficult and it's the, the most difficult is to listen to our co-researchers from the practice field. Uh, they don't speak in our manner of speaking. They are not using our tribe language. They are not thinking in the quite well we we are thinking as academics in 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 boxes and in categories they don't so we were struggling and and we were succeeding at last uh, in writing the 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 final reports together using the, their language and our language in a hybrid sense um, but it's it it was difficult and what was more difficult was that I'm a political scientist and some of the two professors in the team were sociologists and, and, and recovery researchers they were deep into the, the international discourse on on recovery and uh, uh, social recovery and social methods for social uh, care uh, and i was eager to 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 highlight and to 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 do some studies on the the municipality role the 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 the, pol the, the political uh, rhetorics and 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 priorities in the norwegian welfare model and so forth so and it was hard to 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 fit together a, a study that was not you know going in in every directions uh, so that's the critical view on our own role it's 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 we we we, we cannot continue studying uh, practical fields with only one pair of glasses. Uh, the other cr critical view uh, or stand uh, angle is to the sport community because in the, sp in the, the big, enormous uh, sport industry community, it's also kind of difficult to 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 fit things together to 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 to. To make them see things in a, a more whole perspectives, and let me take one example. One of the clubs where we're studying is actually two organizations: one commercial organization with all the sponsorships and ticket sales and uh, every, you know all the commercial activities, and they were also a volunteer organization, as the football clubs original were. What do I know? 70, 80, 100 years ago. And those two organizations are, of course, interweaved, uh, but, but they are, have a manager on both sides and they have a logic and a focus on different things. And when we started to discuss and, and, and investigate how they were working with social innovation, social entrepreneurship, social values they were splitted in two diverse two different ways to 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 see the world to understand why and how they were doing this and they were not prepared so they were kind of surprised by uncovering that in fact, we are two separate words in under one roof. So, and when we were addressing the the, the University College of Sport in Norway, which is a quite 
well-known and, and ambitious uh, academic institution and were discussing this with them, they were not either prepared to, to see both the sociological, the, the political, the, the business approaches together because they were narrow in their sense uh, or from their perspective they were co also quite locked in in their own perspective on what really sport and, and sport uh, development is so we have to to find some arenas and some uh, activities and some actors together uh, and that's what I was hearing also was the introdu introduction to this part of this roundtable session. Daniel, so thank you. Yeah, th th thank you, Lars, and I, I also definitely agree. The first prerequisite is that we have openness to hear each other, and after that it comes these issues of learning each other languages and translation between uh, our languages, and we can learn a lot from inter and trans transdisciplinary research uh, of, of it. Uh, Monica. Thank you. So, uh, in my point of view, I think this relationship can be built depending on the social context. So, for example, here in Romania, we have some uh, favorable conditions to approach this relation with the practitioner and with uh, their problems with their challenges for example we have a very very good relation with the special olympics romania maybe you know this organization and of course you have it maybe in your countries but um, i think this is a model of good practice on how the academics can link and work together with this kind of ngos for us a very very valuable resource is represented by the students that can be involved uh, as volunteers in uh, so many activities. And in the same time, they can have this double benefit, helping a social cause, and in the same time, develop their skills that uh, they need in the future. In the same time, I think uh, this uh, social-oriented approach should be declared but by each university and should be assumed. For example, in my university, this kind of uh, partnership with NGOs is reflected also by the involvement in different uh, Erasmus Plus project, projects, for example. As you know, this is a strong condition to be accepted as a um, partnership and to be financed. And this relation with the organization from Norway but also from different countries are, are very good for us because uh, they, uh, all this relation keep us very, very linked, connected to social problems that they identify in different uh, areas. And we try, we try to approach it in a, very, in a very practical way, not as a theoretical approach, but also as practical approach. So I think first is the politics of the university, then it's this, this open mind approach to social problem reflected by a partnership that a university can build. Of course, there are some common events, educational services, and um, some access to facilities. For example, in my university, all the facilities are free for these NGOs that uh, try to offer physical activities or different educational activities to vulnerable people. And um, I think um, all this approach was uh, somehow um, created by this um, national politics in the field of education because we have a lot of infusion funds that uh, were directed to these uh, social issues. So we had to, to adapt our activities and um, 
um, practical stages for students in all this finance direction. So I think we have, we have this role of vector. I think university should be a vector that could link um, scientific and theoretical approach with real life problems. And I think it works. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Monica. And also, for example, regarding these issues, we are talking uh, in uh, Croatia about, of course, civic missions of university and how to enhance them. So not only to do do research, but how to connect with the local communities in achieving some social good. Uh, per, we are we are in the, in, the, in the end of the round table, so we have maybe one or two minute, minutes left. And before I thank you all, I want to just very briefly ask you for each of the participants of the round table to think and to name one, uh, per your opinion, most relevant topic for the for further research uh, agenda on social entrepreneurship in sport. So just just to name to name one, and this would be also aspect uh, on which we will discuss uh, during the day. So what are, for your opinion, one of one most important topic that we need to research in social entrepreneurship uh, and sports area? So uh, Mike and Lars and Monica, and we will finish after that. On the spot, eh? Gosh. Um, <laughs> I guess... <laughs> I guess an important avenue for, for for me in terms of where this group and how social enterprise ought to develop an angle it is bridging the theory from the from quite a, a big literature set in in terms of non profits and and sport um, you know there's huge literature out there already in terms of non-profits and, and health and well-being issues in sport. But there isn't this bridge and connection into the world of social enterprise. And I, and I think, you know, there is this great space there available for, for people interested in, and, and working in this space of social enterprise to, to, to make those bridges and those links and, um, and to really build on, on the, case studies and showcasing um, areas for development in, in local sports, grassroots initiatives that can really impact um, on that literature field, as well as kind of being able to support and engage in practitioners. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Lars? Just, just uh, for all, keep it very short because we want to have a well, bre break I, before the parallel session. I've all, I, I, I already been in the survey and, and answered actually uh, that question. And what I was writing, uh, writing there was that uh, I don't think we could answer that question in a general uh, way because researchers in social matters or sustainable matters in terms of the 17 UN goals should be addressing burning questions in a local, regional, or national context. And what's burning in, in Norway when it comes to substance abuse is another question that then is burning when it goes to homeless people in Portugal. So, so we need to address really questions and, and, and be open-eyed, uh, see what's going on, and then address topics in this matter we are discussing in this uh, round table session according to that. Great, great. Thank you, Lars. And? So, um, in my opinion, I think, uh, I think in the field of sport are less, uh, are less approached paradoxes you know, paradoxes in this field of social entrepreneurship. And I think uh, studying them and their um, specific um, traits in sports could enlarge our vision on this topic and could bring a valuable contribution to really consolidate 
the social entrepreneurship in sports. Thank you, Monica, and then Anne for the end. I think I would take a, um, a very, a very um, sort of easy way out and say all of the above. <laughs> but um, no, um, I, one, I would like to congratulate this Erasmus program and Monica in particular, your um, university's approach. I'm at a university which is very classic and um, there's a bit of rhetoric about community and about engaging, but there is not a single research funding entity which puts so much emphasis on this collaboration and true collaboration of research between NGOs or the grassroots or however you want to call it. So that is something that I think a network like what you have could be very instrumental in um, sharing and promoting and advocating for. And um, Lars, I also think that this idea of truly bringing in the voices um, along the entire way, um, that's often a rhetoric in research, but to actually make it happen is a whole nother thing. So I'm thinking more, rather than one topic, I would say um, some focus on the processes and advocating and sharing these really good, effective processes would be what I would propose. Thank, thank you, Anne, and th thank you all. We are in the end of our roundtable session. I think that uh, we started the conversation on this topic that we continue uh, further. I think that we mentioned a lot of interesting and important research uh, research fields and topics that need to be explored in this area. And this is just the start of the conversation, which will continue to today in parallel session and national stakeholder event. And of course, I hope to continue in the future uh, via different kind of events, some of them possibly the opportunity next uh, next summer, I hope, in Zaragoza on M MS conference. Uh, so before the break, uh, Mihai, do you want to do some house housekeeping around, uh, regarding next, uh, the schedule and next items on the agenda? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, first of all, thank you for your participation here. I put it some data in the chat. Um, there were 17 people, more than seven, 17 people, probably more than this, uh, participating in this roundtable. Um, nine countries represented um, from um, whatever some continents. <laughs> I, I can't count right now the continents. But anyway, um, speaking about uh, the next session, um, it will be the first of the two sessions where we will present different papers. Um, the first paper, the first session would be dedicated to uh, case studies um, and uh, presentations from different fields, different sports, let's put it this way. Uh, while the second one would be uh, the one on football. Uh, so the guys, the big boys, there will be um, all of them. Um, and um, by the end of the um, event, we will have a domestic session where uh, case studies from Romania, including Special Olympics, thank you, Monica, for mentioning this, uh, they will present part of the Romania reality together with um, um, a mapping done by, by Ashoka Romania. So, guys, there are uh, some, um, some interesting um, um, developments uh, in front of us. So um, please stick with us, um, of course, if you have the time. Thank you. Mika, we will now take a break. And in 10, 15 minutes, then we are continuing. Can I just say, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to share the rest of the day with you. It's um, now very dark out. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for um, having me join you. It's been fantastic. And I look forward to the next time I get to connect with you all. 
Likewise, Anne. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anne. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, so um, let's decide. Um, should, we, should we start at, um, at um, 12? And okay. The next okay. session, just to be precise about when we start. Okay, let's start at 12. Wonderful. Thank Great. you. Thank so you. This, this link would be open. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll leave yeah. it open and, and then we'll re, regather in 15 minutes. Yeah, assemble. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and um, the first to present it's um, a team from Romania. Um, the name of the, 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 the title of the paper is Building a Social Enterprise Through Sport. Successful case studies in Romania. So I invite um, a representative of this team to take the floor. Um, I would like to remind you, all of you, the fact that um, due to the time constraints, um, we will have around seven, eight minutes for um, the presentation in itself, uh, hoping that um, there in other seven minutes to be able to have some discussions related to the, um, the paper, the content of the paper. Uh, so basically we'll have a little bit of discussion after each of the papers and we will save some um, 15 minutes uh, at the end of the session for general conclusions if um, the case uh, related to the content of the four papers presenting, presented during the workshop. So um, um, I will be also the, the timekeeper for <laughs> The event. Um, so um, let's start with the first uh, presentation. Okay. Hello to everyone, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Pompidio. I'm from Bucharest, from uh, Uni National University for Physical Education and Sport, like Monica Stanescu and uh, Maxim. Uh, we uh, work with Maxim in the this project, Senta, and. Uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, we had this opportunity to, uh, do, to build something interesting uh, regarding uh, social entrepreneurship. So I will share my screen with you. I have a presentation and I hope you can see it. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> I will not insist on the theoretical aspects of this, uh, this uh, research, but I will tell you just that uh, two years ago we started this project with uh, our intention to, uh, to study some, uh, some cases in Romania, successful uh, case studies regarding uh, social entrepreneurship, and our intention was to, uh, uh, to see how former athletes or athletes are uh, if they are able to to uh, involve in this kind of activities uh, uh, if we have in Romania such cases and uh, we started to ask uh, our friends if they are uh, knowing uh, such uh, successful uh, case studies in uh, in Romania we discussed with uh, various uh, NGOs and um, we started to, to make a list and uh, then <clears throat> the next step was to uh, make interviews and to discuss with uh, this, uh, these people uh, who um, as former athletes uh, started to be interested in uh, uh, social entrepreneurship and uh, how they succeeded to, to build such uh, uh, social enterprises. So, um, we had uh, some uh, important uh, aspects to, to look um, in our work and um, our questions were uh, related to uh, various aspects in, uh, in this direction. We were interested to see their personal uh, aspects, uh, their leadership abilities, uh, their motivation for uh, achievement. Uh, also, uh, uh, 
this uh, their capability to to organize things and uh, we we have some uh, uh, interesting discussion with uh, this uh, these people so um, we made uh, many interviews we observed them uh, in their activities and uh, we started to uh, put the things uh, together and to evaluate their uh, capabilities and their uh, elements uh, which help them to, to succeed. So uh, I think during a year we had uh, this kind of discussions, many interviews with uh, uh, various former athletes uh, who succeeded in uh, uh, their um, way to, to build a social enterprise. So I will go straight to the cases because I think they are the most important. They are the result of our work and the research and uh, the result of our interviews with them and our observation. And I will point, I think, four cases, very short. The first case is the, the case of uh, a football academy, Gheorghe Haji Academy. Uh, which is built uh, uh, in the region of Constanza, uh, close to the Black Sea. And there, Gheorghe Haji, who is a former uh, footballer, uh, built an academy where uh, 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 kids from seven, eight years old are starting to, to, to play football um, and also to be educated in this uh, environment. So uh, this, is, this was an innovative uh, academy for Romania. Even in uh, Western Europe, we have uh, this kind of uh, academies. For Romania, it was an innovative, pro innovative project. And uh, we discussed with Haji about this, uh, this project. He is uh, well known in Romania for this project. And uh, this project uh, has also a social, uh, a social dimension because uh, those kids, those uh, uh, many uh, of these players are coming from uh, uh, poor, uh, let's say, uh, areas and uh, they have this opportunity to, to succeed. So uh, Haji offered them uh, scholarships to, uh, to succeed and uh, then to, um, uh, to have a, a career in, in football. And also this academy produces uh, a lot of players in uh, national teams and it's a successful business. So it is a business with a, with a social dimension and uh, it's something innovative for the Romanian society uh, through sport. Uh, the second example is uh, the project Romania built by um, a former Olympic champion, Ivan Patsaikin, um, who um, started this, uh, this project in, uh, with his association, uh, Ivan Patsaikin Mila 23. And uh, this association promotes the ecotourism and the canoeing in the Danube Delta. He uh, supports uh, small businesses from Danube Delta and uh, it encourages the, the practice of uh, water sports. So uh, Patsaikin is uh, also a national figure in Romania and uh, also we discussed with, with him uh, about uh, this project and uh, his objective was to uh, bring tourists and bring money in the uh, Danube Delta and to also promote, uh, uh, to promote uh, water sports and uh, he succeeded to, uh, to help uh, local businesses with uh, this project and also it was an innovative because um, he succeeded to combine this uh, uh, sport dimension with uh, tourism and uh, business. So uh, we, we discussed with a lot of families in Danube Delta, which uh, uh, confessed their uh, help from Ivan Patsaikin project. And uh, they confessed that the, the tourism in uh, Danube Delta uh, increased after the involvement of Ivan Patsaikin in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of project. Um, okay, the, the third project that we have documented was uh, also a football um, a school uh, made by Viorel Kraus, uh, who is a former footballer who lived in the United States for almost uh, 20 years. And uh, he came back in Romania. He, uh, he sold his academy in the United States and uh, he came back in Romania to, to create this academy in uh, in Bucharest, where he has only social cases, uh, kids from uh, poor families, uh, 
kids who have uh, problems with drugs and uh, other other problems like this and he offered them uh, the possibility the opportunity to play football and to educate uh, them so uh, he makes this with uh, uh, with his own money after he he sold his academy in united states and uh, he started to uh, to involve in uh, in social activities with uh, with kids uh, uh, showing that football could be uh, an opportunity for uh, for them uh, also uh, an interesting uh, case study is uh, the uh, case of claudio uh, miu not Mew. one one minute please yeah uh, an important case he's a former national champion and uh, he started an ngo uh, climb again association uh, which helps people with disabilities to make sport and to improve their uh, their conditions so we discussed with every uh, of these people we have many more other cases but i think it is important to show that we dis discussed with them we made interviews with them uh, several times we try to to see uh, which are their uh, abilities, how they think they uh, have succeeded, and uh, uh, which could be the, the recipe for uh, this kind of uh, activities, because they all are innovative. They are, uh, many of them, they are uh, successful businesses, and they uh, are, have this ability to find uh, strong partners to, uh, to help them in their projects. So, it's, this is the, the idea we, we started to, to bring together all these uh, case studies to, to see how they succeeded in their uh, activities. Okay. Great. Um, okay, thank thanks. you very much for your presentation. Um, if there are um, questions related to the content of the presentation, I, uh, I I have a question, if I may. Sure. So you look at the various very interesting case studies. Did you possibly try any try in any aspect assess uh, what is the sustainability of those those initiatives, not only financial but but social one, and also uh, how is recognition and public perception of these initiatives? Are they uh, wide known or some of them are wide known, some local, depending on the former athlete or type of initiatives, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for your question. Uh, actually, yeah, it was a criteria for us to see the sustainability of these projects. Uh, we uh, tried to, to find uh, projects with uh, more than five years ex of existence. So uh, to have, let's say, uh, uh, a longer activities because one of our questions in this project was to see uh, why some other projects are failing. Uh, so we looked at projects with uh, at least uh, five years of uh, activities to, to see them uh, uh, and to analyze them uh, properly. So yeah, they all of them, they have uh, this uh, economical dimension and uh, they are in this moment, they are uh, uh, on the on the right track in their activity regarding the um, uh, their know the knowledge about these uh, these projects at the national level i think uh, most of them are uh, nationally recognized because uh, they are former athletes with uh, great performances and it helped them to to promote their projects like haji like patsaikin uh, others like uh, Björk Klaus or uh, Claudio Mew Association Cl Climb Again are not so uh, well known, but uh, they are trying to, uh, to be uh, more present in the media. For example, uh, the Climb Again Association has many partnerships with uh, many uh, media channels and they are more and more active in this, in this uh, direction. So they are uh, aware that they have to be more uh, uh, more present in the in the media and that they are using their uh, activities to and their networks to to be more present in the in the media and to to show to the public that what they are doing is uh, uh, is a, a nice project 
And um, I can I can confirm, Daniel, that um, while not being all of them famous, um, but being identified by my students during a research, um, asking them to map social entrepreneurship initiatives in sports. Um, while well, some, some students also identified among the, the cases, um, those which were presented today, obviously they have some visibility. Um, again, not of all of them, as uh, Pompilio mentioned, are um, as famous as, you know, Haji. But um, anyway, they, they, they got some visibility nowadays in Romania. Right. Any other question, please? I have a question, if it's possible. Sure. Uh, thank you for this presentation. And I'm, I'm curious about uh, your last uh, page, because the, the, the conclusions, uh, I think maybe you run out of time. So could, could you share that? Uh, uh, because my question may be are answered on that on that page. Uh, because the, my my question is 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 there any any common uh, conclusions uh, that could be scaled and 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 made uh, and made uh, more general as as a good advice for me because. Uh, I I've been addressed by some some former athletes. Uh, which has some uh, ideas of making a social enterprise. And I was curious about uh, what I'm reading now. So maybe you could. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you, Lars, for your uh, question. Actually, we have uh, published uh, a few months ago an article. Uh, and uh, most of these uh, case studies are, are in there in uh, sustain sustainability uh, uh, review. So. Uh, we analyzed uh, some of the, the cases there and uh, uh, we observed that uh, the network and, uh, is very important for this, uh, these people. So uh, their network uh, created in time uh, was uh, essential to, to succeed. Uh, even some of the former athletes are not so uh, well known at the national level, but they're ability to develop a network and their relationships with uh, various uh, uh, companies and uh, things like this uh, help them to, to succeed. So, yeah, it was one of the main observations and uh, conclusions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, invite now, um, no, um, there is a request um, from Maxim, um, and I hope that um, the others would agree. Um, Maxim would um, ask us to be the second to present because he's um, scheduled in, in some other meeting. So uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Maxim to present Athletes Becoming Social Entrepreneurs. Um, I understand that this is a project, as Monica was mentioning, the Santa project, and um, Maxim, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It is really in important for us to share the results of our project and what was our intention. And it's very nice to see the familiar faces here. Uh, so let me just share my presentation. Uh, yes, uh, let's say. So uh, we don't have much time, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. Yes, and uh, yeah. So uh, let me show first present. Oh, Fury Misut, this is the coordinator of, and uh, I'm the executive director of this organization. We are located in Oslo, and Fury Misut is about the focus areas that are we have is sports, uh, outdoor tourism, uh, youth and uh, medicine. And uh, we have we were established in 2013 and start with uh, making some small arrangements and uh, meetings, projects. And then in 2018, we start with the bigger project, international projects. And uh, this is how we work actually, is that we aim to produce evidence-based knowledge and uh, developing approaches transform into technical knowledge. And uh, basically 
we are project based uh, organization so uh, the idea behind the project is uh, first we took a dual career of the athletes and what is it about that they the thing is that uh, the challenge is to combine the career sporting career with education or work and uh, their aim to succeed at the high level of sports is is demands the intensive training and competitions so this is a difficult to reconcile the challenges and this comes from the european union guidelines of on dual career of athletes and uh, so there are basically two options for athletes so going for wage employment or for safe employment and uh, for wage employment there are uh, quite a lot of uh, support both nationally internationally with some uh, programs uh, starting from international olympic committee and uh, some uh, international sporting hubs and stuff but when you talk about self-employment so there uh, the way is going for entrepreneurship to become an entrepreneur and of course there are different types of entrepreneurship and uh, this could be acad academic public sector entrepreneurship corporate or private independent entrepreneurship but what was our focus is going to for social entrepreneurship because this is a quite new notion and uh, not too many people or too many uh, organizations took that uh, notion in their uh, focus before there was a pretty much research but uh, yeah i don't go into what is the social entrepreneurship here and what was our idea is that uh, elite athletes play important role in philanthropic communities they are very active in uh, foundations are helping others and a lot of uh, good examples on that type but uh, it is at the same time it's important to develop their social entrepreneurship competencies and what we found out is that there is no structured course curriculum for sports organizations and uh, for trainers and for, to support the dual career of uh, these elite athletes on social entrepreneurship. This is how the idea came. And this is our project, uh, which was uh, funded by European Union uh, over Erasmus Plus Sport program. And uh, it was a two years project, which is ending. Actually, it was supposed to end to its extent to three more months because of the COVID situation. And we had uh, eight partners uh, in this project uh, where we are coordinators and we have uh, two universities, UNEVS from Romania and you come from Spain and we have a, a network of European sports education, which is uh, 13 or 14 different universities, maybe more, I don't remember actually. And we have two big organizations, one from uh, Bulgaria and uh, from Belgium and the uh, Olympic Committee of Bosnia-Herzegovina and uh, we had a, an NGO from uh, Canada and we actually uh, were uh, innovators in that field to involve uh, a Canadian partner in the Erasmus Plus program and so no, no one before did that. So what was the overall objective is to uh, support this uh, the, the guideline that I mentioned and uh, develop a sport focused social entrepreneurship program and uh, based on that program uh, create an innovative curriculum and uh, gamification based training modules uh, so these are the uh, outputs of our program the curricula digital platform and the report from uh, the pilot scheme Oh, well, but how the program is really works or not or what are their results and our uh, uh, let's say uh, impact or whatever so i don't go into the research so there was a, a both desk and field work research done by our uh, uh, experienced partners or universities and each partner was working here and uh, finally this is the structure of our course so that we came to so we, there the course is uh, on uh, seven modules and uh, first we were looking into why we need the social entrepreneurship for athletes 
So very short about uh, and social entrepreneurship in, in the background. Then we uh, given a presentation of profile of a social entrepreneurs. Then we speak about the change making in society and the why, who are the role, who are the change makers. Further, we go to the theory to practice on how to plan the career. And then we present a social business model, a social business model canvas, and uh, mention the technological social entrepreneurship and how technology can be involved in entrepreneurship because there are so many entrepreneurship in sports that are uh, using technology and uh, we were focused on social uh, uh, part of that and finally uh, we underline the uh, social impact by sport and uh, how it correlates with the sustainable development goals of UN uh, and Thank you. yes Please try to conclude there are 30 seconds Yes, I'm all finished. So you know, we were we wanted to make a or apply gamification principle because we wanted to have it more in, uh, engaged and more interactive for the participants and implemented uh, gamification mechanics to the platform uh, and uh, some dynamics to that. And uh, this is the how the platform actually looks like right now it's still under pilot testing but it is working so i'm i would really uh, appreciate if you can uh, go there and uh, check the platform and go into the content so if i had change i could present it to you but as far as i understand we are very <laughs> low on time so this is basically you, you see this is the platform and the, the gamification uh, Principles is like there are total members, ranking, score, and there is the progression bar here. And then you have the uh, different uh, badges and uh, statuses, which is changing here. So this is very quick, very short. Uh, so we have a, a dualcareer.net, the website of the, pro of the program of our project and yeah we can follow us on social media very short <laughs> uh yes if you have any questions thank you martin for your presentation um we still have a couple of minutes to ask questions if um you have questions for maxim okay i i, I have maxim one question so <laughs> Former athletes will be included in this educational program. Is it in your project that you are uh, following the, the outcomes for former athletes? For example, how much of them uh, started some social business or business afterwards or any other type of impact that this education and your project have, have on them? Well, on our uh, plan, after we finalize the project, we do have uh, a intent, intention of, of following up uh, the participants and the take uh, who uh, participate in the course. Although it's uh, not, our intention is not to uh, give or to give the all the necessary knowledge on the social entrepreneurship just a small depot to the for the artists that there is this possibility that you can also enter the social entrepreneurship and uh, if there is a, a lot because in the platform there are a lot of extra uh, resources or resources that uh, they can go further and go deeper and uh, we will try to uh, uh, follow up their progression or all the participants what are their uh, perception and what is it uh, really uh, interest if, if they are interested in starting the social business yeah so we are going to follow that up yeah but of course it's it's it, it was going to be of course a hard work to follow it up for a long in a long term yeah, yeah, hopefully we are, yeah, yeah we are going to uh, build a, a different uh, project uh, based on this so we will see how the things are going to uh, develop 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, other question? Yeah. Thank Actually, you. I just want to add something. Uh, during this, those two years, we had some workshops in our university and uh, those students and other people interested, former athletes interested in this project came to us because they're interested to find out about uh, social uh, entrepreneurship and few of them are trying to apply this, uh, these things and uh, because they are our students and uh, we are all already know them, uh, we ask them to uh, inform us uh, from time to time to three to six uh, months uh, how they are evolving in their projects. For example, you have someone who wants to open a, a basketball club for uh, wheelchair uh, athletes. Uh, in, so uh, uh, it, during these workshops, we had uh, people interested to, to open a social enterprise and uh, we keep in touch with, uh, with them. So we are also interested to, to find out if they apply this uh, knowledge and uh, if they will succeed, of course. Very happy to hear that um, in the university, there is such a pragmatic approach in yeah. trying to help the community through sports, um, the topic of our workshop. Uh, especially, uh, very, I'm, I'm happy especially about the, the structure of the course, which Maxim described because we also have in our university, um, the faculty of sport, I'm teaching a course, um, not specifically on social entrepreneurship, but which would include social entrepreneurship. And it's about um, sport professionals uh, dedicating their activity to community. So it's very close in the same line um, of thinking. Right, guys, we should go farther then and ask um, Daniel, Baturina, um, to present us um, the, the paper, which is titled Exploring New Areas, Sports and Third Sector Organizations in Croatia and Social Entrepreneurship Opportunities. Daniel, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I hope that you all are seeing my screen. And you can see the presentation. Uh, so basically, I will talk a little bit about potentials of sports as a social, uh, potentials of third sector organization of making an areas of exploring uh, social entrepreneurship uh, opportunities in Croatia. But what we have noticed that sports in Croatia is have a very long tradition, but it's also it is related to national identity in different ways, and we are very proud of the sports and its achievements, but it's relatively unresearched phenomena. And I briefly unresearched phenomena because we are mostly looking and oriented towards sports successes, as this uh, picture is, is um, uh, suge suggesting, and we are not uh, so involved in, in looking deeply into, into sports. And so my goal is to explore these opportunities uh, for social entrepreneurship and I'll look a little bit closely at the third sector sports organizations in, in Croatia. As this is preliminary area of study and very unresearched area, my methodology is basically uh, this, this research. I will talk firstly, just briefly, uh, generally on the third sector, then on the third sector in sports and sports in general, and then opportunities for uh, development of sports social, social enterprises. So regarding uh, third sector in Croatia, we basically have around 52,000 uh, third sector organizations, mostly, most of them, almost all of them associations, around 20,000 employed person, 1.5, approximately we don't have uh, precise statistics uh, share of gdp of this income of these organizations in, in share of gdp main areas are sports and recreation culture and welfare by the financing and by the number of uh, organization after the democratic transition in the 90s we have a turbulent post-war period when third sector organizations were under different suspicions as being like foreign agents or, or, or similar developments. And uh, this is still reflected today with relatively unfavorable attitudes towards toward the civil society. And 
since that period, we have significant improvements in uh, institutional framework, but we still have a relatively restricted law, especially for association. For example, associations, for example, last law was more oriented towards controlling the uh, intersector organization, not providing them space to act. Uh, we have a lot of strategies, but strategies are not implemented in the proper way. Tax framework is still relatively unfavorable for development of uh, economic activities of in the in the third sector and then social entrepreneurship as well and also for development of philanthropy uh, regarding current situation in organizational environment in everyday life of, life of organization our former researches show that lack of financial resources is significant problem nowadays especially of course in in, in pandemic that diversification of funding uh, sources is a trend mostly related to uh, available eu funds for the third sector organization but also in some part for uh, their economic activity uh, the, which they are starting and we see that there's a lot of issues with in, unstable uh, human resources because of course a lot of organization are project depending and projects are very unreliable in their calendar calendar in the in the way that they are uh, funded in frequently and other aspects as i mentioned still there's a relatively negative public image of third sector organizations so, so their impacts to the social impacts are not so recognized but you know few scandals now and then are burdening the public image and we have uh, untrust of the of the government over civil society and government is especially nowadays once again trying to control key institutions that are related to development of civil society uh, there's a lack of modernization of capacities and i just mentioned welfare mix which is uh, which is undeveloped constant integration regarding sports uh, we have a national sports program which is which is current from the last year to it's a seven years long program it, it's made main program for framing sports area in croatia it's oriented as it states toward the healthy and active nation proud of sporting successes so this is like an overall mission or a theme of this document and it basically is oriented towards three parts sports in educational system recreative sports and protection and improvement of health and competitive competitive sports uh, key institutions are central state office for sports these are the number of athletes of course you have big number of athletes but small number of categorized athletes that could be considered professional and there was only some research regarding the sports mainly related to social cultural aspects of sports in croatia and most dominantly to football and uh, different uh, topics related to football. Sports associations, uh, on the other hand, have a bigger share of third sector organizations in Croatia, so around 35% of all associations are in sports, and they receive one of the largest share of public finances. This is in the Croatian Kunas, but it's around 20, uh, 27, 28 million uh, euros per year only welfare uh, welfare associations are receiving uh, more of public public income what is the big biggest barriers and biggest issues in third sector organizations in sports that we researched a couple of, a couple of years ago so one is issue of jurisdiction between central government and local government related to governance and funding so we have a complex complex hierarchical structures that is impeding ability ability to act and and uh, is making things un unclear in different aspects one aspect is uh, there is no clear developed standards for reporting or financing of sport especially at the local levels for so we don't have um, complete and concrete data of, of what is financing on which uh, which criteria and there's a governance problem like of strategic planning for the development of sports at the national level which was supposed to be tackled with this uh, last last program sports as organization have a general general positive image 
but also that image is uh, recently shaken by some scandals, especially in the football area. It is interesting to see that uh, the question is raised, do professional clubs need to be companies and association, especially as top three third sector organization per income, uh, were, per income in 2016 were sports organization. One I minute. Will skip, I will skip, yeah, I will skip this on development of social entrepreneurship uh, and just say what are some opportunities for development of social entrepreneurship in sport. So we recognize that Previously, some social cooperatives in area of sports re in recreation have been funded. And now, just a couple of months ago, we saw first sports social enterprises financed uh, by European social, social fund tender. Uh, only two initiatives, but they supported for development of the area. And from the social policy domain in which I work, we noticed a couple of aspects in which sports social enterprises could be developed. One is uh, related to the well-being of elderly and active aging, which is undeveloped concept in Croatia. Other is uh, related to social inclusion uh, of youth, especially we study need population as potential one of the target groups. Community building, especially in local areas where there's a lack of social infrastructure, but we have sports associations as one of the rare facets of community, community life, and especially prevention of diseases and promotion of health. So basically what I wanted to conclude, we have a bigger share of Croatian third sector in sports or, uh, organi uh, organizations, but they are not properly researched and understood. And I, we see some, per, some area that uh, I mapped on the slide before as a potential, but there are some prerequisites. So activation of third sector organizations in sports beyond business as usual, more transparent financing, recognition of this area. So Sport is recognized by third sector and social entrepreneurship are not. And using the power of identity which sport has in a, in a, Croatian, a Croatian population. So basically, my conclusion is on this question, should they be companies or association? Why not both? Why not uh, be social entrepreneurship, social enterprises? And I see a couple of areas in which uh, that development can be fostered. And in the end, just want to conclude with some pictures that show how much em emotion and, ad and identity is drawn uh, in Croatian society via, via sports. And this is also a potential that could be tapped on to uh, transform and develop initiatives for social good in a social entrepreneurship area. Um, so thank you uh, all for attention. Thank you, Daniel, um, for your presentation. A um, couple of questions we can take right now, if you have... Yeah, Lars. I just wanted to give a thumb up for the presentation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and I have also to say that we are, we are meeting Croatia in a women's uh, European uh, Championship on Saturday. And uh, handball. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are very much looking forward to that. This was yes. kind, of, kind of a first for our, our team that is doing so well. So, but well, this, well. this is also the issue of, of sports when we look at, uh, uh, as I mentioned, national identities and uh, how that uh, potential can be transformed. We had a big argument in a, in a public after the World Cup in 2018 in which Croatia had a Great, great success, and uh, I put uh, some picture of our president uh, mm -hmm. from another is Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, who was very much involved uh, in making public image about that. And uh, we talk among each other and in the public about galvanizing effect of this sports event for not only development of sports, but for using the sports potential to engage people on, on some other. Um, so, uh, aspects of social good, for example, for development of volunteer activities, for philanthropy, for using the, uh, this sports space as a galvanizing um, moment in, uh, in, in our society. But uh, of course, and in, as it any other su successes, these uh, topics were uh, very shortly drained so, and forgotten. So this is, this is also kind of repeating, yeah. Okay. May I ask um, uh, Pompilio wanted to ask something? Yeah, uh, actually, I want to to congratulate Daniel for this presentation, and uh, I'm fascinated about the 
Croatian uh, ability to succeed in, in sport. Yesterday, so Croatia beat Romanian handball. And uh, my question was related to that, that national plan uh, you mentioned, which started in the last year. Uh, it is something mentioned about uh, this uh, orientation to, uh, to social enterprises or to stimulate uh, athletes or, I don't know, this NGOs or other companies to, to involve, to be involved uh, in that national plan to, to, to sport? Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for your comments and uh, question. It mentions association a lot, not social enterprises per se, but social enterprises are not so recognized in also other as aspects of our society in, in sports, especially. Uh, I look at that program in, in a lot of detail and it's much, much better than previous one, given uh, the participation of star stakeholders, levels of analysis and uh, quality of uh, process in doing uh, this kind of strategic document. They discuss in length on, on uh, possibilities of association in different capacities. Association as uh, semi or uh, professional clubs, association in local communities, for example, association as a, a sports network uh, in the education, education system. So, so they are mapping and tapping on some area of work of associations that could be that is very close and could be transformed in social uh, entrepreneurship initiatives, but they are not uh, mentioning it as recently. I would comment um, a little bit on, on this, considering the reality in Romania, we have a, a very nice strategy on sport. And the last version we got, um, I'm, I'm following um, this document for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, and I saw the improvement in terms of the content. Uh, it's, very, it's very in line with the um, European uh, White Charter on sport, but uh, one should make um, uh, uh, the difference between what it's written and uh, the organizational practice, which is completely different world. But uh, that's just a mean comment um, on, um, on my own reality. Let's yeah, go. I'm, I'm yeah. Can I just comment on that? Yeah, I already mentioned that we also have a similar tradition that strategies are not uh, implemented so well, uh, so well in Croatia, but it's good to see that at least they have well thought strategy. So that's, uh, that's the first thing. And uh, I think that in Croatia sports have that kind of status that if someone wants to do something uh, on this area, it would gather a wider support and would certainly have a political blessing to do so. So uh, my opinion is from uh, last period, last period, maybe last 10, 15 years, that uh, the problem was capacity to do things. And I see a little bit of capacity in, in drawing this document, but we will see how it reflects in uh, reality. Okay, thank you. Any other question for uh, Daniel, if there is? If no, then um, I should present the, the next uh, paper to be presented. And it shouldn't be very difficult because um, I'm going to present um, running with the community in mind. And I promise you to start also the chronometer. So, uh, uh, excuse me? No, it was just microphone. Yeah, but um, where does this come from? From Mark's, from, from Mark's if, if but it wasn't If someone question. forgets to mute, you can hear them talking yeah. in the background. Yeah, you, you can press. Okay. Uh, share, share, share. Right, I hope that you get uh, my uh, screen. Is it okay? Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, super. Um, running with the community in mind. It's, um, and I was, I'm, I'm very happy that Daniel um, had the presentation before me because I noticed that most of the people focused um, on the specific case studies, uh, skipping the theoretical part. 
but Daniel opened somehow the door for some theoretical discussion. So I'm, uh, I'm going to start giving you a little bit of the Romanian specific context. Um, because I, I, but then I, I would like to give you also some, some ideas which I would like to discuss. Um, speaking about Romania, the notion of social economy is quite recent in our public discussion. And actually, it's more or less related to the um, years 2006 7 um, when Romania was a candidate to enter the European Union. Um, it was the time when somehow our um, part of our public agenda was connected with um, uh, was connecting with the European agenda. So somehow um, this is the way that um, the discussion about the social entrepreneurship, social entre social economy, mostly entered the the public space in in Romania. Moreover, while um, the discussion in terms of the um, those concepts, complementary concepts, in the academic world, uh, in the academic world um, in Romania, it's still um, in a very incipient phase. Um, the, the, the government, um, specifically the, the labor ministry, um, adopted, initiated in 2011 a law on social economy which was adopted four years later because of a lot of struggles related to the content. Um, so every time they, they were pre proposing something, um, NGOs, activists, mostly from social services, they were um, complaining about uh, the content of the law. And I would uh, stop discussing this, uh, saying that um, even nowadays the law, it's, uh, it's, it's quite ambiguous. Uh, it's not very clear if it's for general purpose or for um, work social integration work uh, wisely work integration social enterprises so it's it's kind of um, uh, tricky but anyway um, the um, the theory here well um, I would say that um, looking to the the um, um, literature um, on social entrepreneurship one could find basically two approaches uh, on the social entrepreneurship con construct. One would define um, social entrepreneurship as being related to uh, an organization, a trade organization, an organizational form, um, adopting a social purpose. Um, the second one, it's more broadly, and it's about um, an organization which, with a social purpose um, adopting uh, commercial behavior, so changing the organizational behavior. So basically, in um, both of those two um, approaches, the commercial dimension is a common feature. On the other hand, on the general perspective on the social entrepreneurship concept is that uh, it would concern entrepreneurial activities, whatever would, does it mean, it, it, this is something to, to be clarified, uh, with an embedded social purpose. And in this respect, social purpose or mission, depends on the school, um, it's, it's an explicit main feature of the social entrepreneurial organization as um, some of um, famous authors would, would define. And in, in, in this respect, um, one would find a lot of definitions for social entrepreneurship. Um, the working definition um, I'm, I'm proposing is that social entrepreneurship is the process initiated by a person or a group of persons which take the risk of an enterprise, either activity or organization. So basically until here it's, it's defining entrepreneurship, explicitly aiming at creating social value. So this is basically how we make the difference between entrepreneurship in general and social entrepreneurship. And uh, one could... Uh, could see in the literature that there is a lot of discussion about social value, which in the, this case concerned the society at, lar of lar at large or a group in the society. Um, and as I, I show in this slide, you can see that the, the meaning of, of social value, it's related to generally social good, uh, public benefit, whatever. Um, but it's not something which is very clear. Anyway, it would have um, a connotative, uh, a positive um, connotation. And it's uh, obviously a positive outcome of solving social problems. 
Uh, now I would like to go back because I'm 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 um, I'm coming from um, a, a school of economics, management and economics. I would like to go back to the root concept, which is the entrepreneurship concept. And in a basic perspective, um, entrepreneurship, regardless the type, so being for profit or um, for a social purpose, implies a couple of um, um, activities like identifying the problem, selecting a solution, mobilizing resources, implementing the solution. So th these are basics um, in every, every approach related to entrepreneurship. The, the conclusion here is that the, the commercial dimension, it's not explicit as it would be described in, in the literature related to social entrepreneurship uh, presented initially. Um, and as a, as a case study, which um, I would like to use as an argument for uh, my position, which is um, related to, again, um, the fact that this, the commercial dimension, it's not uh, really a must there um, it's not really defining the entrepreneurial uh, process i would like to present the the allergotura case study which is um, an organization in um, in timisoara romania in my town and uh, as i still have a couple of minutes um, i i can i can do in a slow pace right now Choosing my case study, I used to, I'm, I'm, I like running and I'm participating also in, in some running competitions. Um, and a couple of, no, it's already, I don't know, more than 10 years, something like this, 10 years ago. In one of the competition, I, I noticed a group of um, guys in yellow shirts, um, appearing to be a team and um, asking around who are they because they were very visible in in the the group there i found that it's it's one one guy there um who's asking some other guys to run together in order to collect money for um, social um, institution um dedicated to children so basically, it, it was um, um, a charitable approach. Um, they, they wanted to, to develop based uh, using running as an opportunity. Um, later on, um, as, a, as a consultant and, um, on um, organizational de development, I've been asked by the initiator to help him, um, which obviously it was a social entrepreneurship, to help him um, um, start an organization. So this is how Alergotura appeared. Um, uh, and, all, and I like the, the idea because um, basically he wanted to start an organization which um, was supposed to use running in order to support somehow the community. Um, Alergotura um, has as a basic idea to create opportunities for individuals to participate in weekly scheduled events called Ture, which in Romanian would, would stand for round, laps in Romanian. So Alergotura would mean I'm running um, a, a lap. Huh? Um, and these are all perfect opportunity to socialize and are the main driver of Alergotura in promoting a healthy lifestyle. Basically, what they are doing, weekly tours, the one which I described, which is are related to um, uh, the neighborhoods. Um, and in each neighborhood, there is one um, um, active person initiating um, a, a group to, to run together um, in, in the neighborhood. And starting 2019, they also have a culture tour on, on the main cultural historic objective in Banat area which is done, of course, running. So they run from one cultural objective to, to another. Uh, they, there are a lot of big events which they organize a couple of um, couple times um, a year in different formats, uh, outdoor, uh, I mean, um, on, on some trails, but also in, in the city. And probably um, you have some data about how, how they manage to to publicly mobilize people in, in Timisoara, it's really impressive. I, I, I have a lot of envy for their success. And uh, the last minute I would use to uh, tell you about the most important uh, event of uh, um, 
of their um, activity, which is Team Motion. Team Motion, it's a community event, it's a fundraising event where NGOs would propose different projects, different uh, uh, with different um, uh, uh, issues. So it could be social, cultural, whatever, different um, environmental projects. And um, the idea is that participants would try to raise money um, by competing in this event, where it's more important uh, to participate than, um, than uh, the, the final results. Of course, there are some sponsors um, and a lot of volunteers involved. So it's basically a community. It's the largest community event for raising funds um, on NGO projects. It's, um, I would say, the ideal opportunity for uh, uh, community involvement. And uh, in, in this respect, um, you have some, some figures here in, for 2019, more than 100,000 euros collected, uh, 6,000 participants for a town of 300 people. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, unfortunately, in 2020, uh, despite the, the pandemic format, we, you know, it was no hugging edition. <laughs> And you can see in the picture uh, how empty the space looks like. Uh, we still managed to, to convince more than 1,500 participants to um, join the event. And um, more than 50,000 euros were collected for uh, NGO projects. Um, so that's it. The conclusion is that um, uh, social entrepreneurship, it's not necessarily about selling. It doesn't necessarily involve commercial activities. It's rather about identifying a problem, putting a solution up there, and uh, mobilizing resources while taking the risk um, of uh, implementing the project. Thank you for um, your attention. Um, if there are any questions, uh, we'd be, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, let me come back. Maybe I could give a compliment and, and follow up with a question, Mahil. Sure. Thank you. Uh, great that you, you gave us a, 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 a contextual framework for your topic uh, and your, your reflections, uh, which underlines that uh, I think it's, it's, it is important it is important for us to 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 see sport and se uh, or, or si social innovation and or social enterprise and social entrepreneurship in a contextual framework as i have earlier said um, and it is easier for us while i'm sitting here in the south of norway actually and it's, it's snowing outside now uh, and, and understanding uh, Croatian and, and Romanian and Australian and different uh, sport activities in an innovation framework. It's, it's, it's very important to understand the contextual, political, financial uh, and, and cultural framework this is happening within. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Lars, for your comment. Um, uh, any other questions or comments? Um, okay. If uh, there is nothing else to comment on on this presentation, um, I would uh, invite you to take a um, couple of minutes um, and to try to um, um, conclude on the whole uh, package of presentations during the session. Um, if there is um, anybody interested in trying to get um, the floor, I just I just want to say that we, we saw some some great initiatives and some uh, some great projects and cases cases presented. That this is what is exactly our meaning in this uh, presentation se sessions to tap into. The diverse area on, of uh, 
social entrepreneurship in, in sport and try to you know to uh, to to discover a bit uh, a bit by bit and to enrich our knowledge on the, on this uh, unexplored topic. Yeah, indeed, it was really enjoyable to see how many common aspects we can identify in um, projects uh, developed in very different countries and without the knowledge uh, of those similarities and, and common interests. And uh, obviously, this is a great opportunity for us to um, find new ways uh, to, to develop um, um, our activities as individuals, but also to um, try to join um, common venture like um, the one which uh, MS is starting right now. Okay, guys, if um, there is no other comment uh, here, um, thank you for your participation. Um, it was more, uh, more than, than, than enjoyable. Uh, I would recall, I would like to recall the fact that um, we will have a break now. And um, I would invite you to come back for at 1.30 for the second uh, paper presentation session. Ses session. Um, and uh, don't forget that by the end of the event, we, we also have a domestic session where we will present um, some case studies from Romania uh, by practitioners. So themselves, they will be here. And also we will have Ashoka, Romania, which uh, developed a um, mapping of uh, social entrepreneurship in sports initiatives in, in my country. Um, Just a, a question. We are, we are half an hour behind. Uh, do we really need a break as 25 minutes? Uh, maybe you should... Uh... Actually, Lars? Yes. The 25 minutes will put us uh, exactly in, 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 okay. the, in the program. Okay. Yes, we are not, we are not behind, yeah. No, we okay. are a couple of minutes, right, but yeah. Due to the harsh but, moderation as a chair, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have to, case. I have okay. to say it because nobody else said it. So it was <laughs> harsh, I, I, I admit it. Uh, we are now in, in, in the schedule, so basically uh, those who would like to join us uh, for just for the second uh, presentation session, they, they will be, uh, let's put it this way, in time. Uh, so let's meet uh, again uh, 1.30 Brussels yeah. time, okay? Like yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah, see you at 1.30. Okay. Have a good lunch. Uh, you have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. I'll show you my presentation in this way. It's okay. Uh, Mikhail, can you give me the thumbs up? Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Well, I already, uh, I think, uh, touched upon my our our uh, study uh, recovery on the pitch. Uh, we did this in uh, in uh, 2018 as a, actually more or less as a, a pre-study. So we are actually now dimensioning it up to a broader national-wide study. Uh, hopefully, getting some uh, funding. From the Norwegian Research Council, uh, the the answer on our application will come next week. So it's uh, it's very uh, kind of frightening uh, how this is going to be. But uh, the recovery on the pitch uh, study of four um, football clubs. Uh, I want to press present this now. Uh, just have to shut down the all the nice pictures of you, unfortunately, uh, and give you some essential observations and, and findings from this study, uh, which hopefully is interesting also outside a Norwegian context, even if it's bound to the Norwegian context, as you will soon see. It's a program, uh, the, the, the street football program in Norwegian Gatelags football, 
really not a street football as such, but uh, as I have already told, uh, a, a program uh, included in the the, the, the ordinary uh, football club's activity and facil facilities. Uh, it's uh, the target group is people with mental health and substance ab abuse challenges. It's a daytime activity. Uh, some clubs three days a week, some actually five days a week, uh, keeping them away from dr their drug abuse. Uh, one day without uh, drugs is a good day, uh, they, they say, and if they are training uh, seven days a week uh, or five days a week and tournaments in, during the weekend, that you can imagine it's quite dramatic uh, well-being and, and recovering for those uh, men or women, boys and girls, this is adults. This is happening in various collaboration with local public uh, mental health uh, programs, the, the public services. And that's what um, surprised us most in the, in the project that it was so little standardized uh, so little uh, it it we we say in our report that it's really no model to be exposed because it's so uh, great vari vari variations uh, between the municipalities uh, they, uh, the the program has uh, increased from 1 to 22 clubs since 2011 and we studied four of, four of them in four different uh, cities in two regions of Norway. And this is going on in a concept of a very strongly public dominated welfare model, as I have said. But this great, uh, or sorry, uh, dominated welfare, public welfare model has high general legitimacy. So people want it to be like that. We have three research questions. One individual research approach. Uh, do the activity have any impact on one and each of them? Why, if they have? A local organizational approach. Is the service provided? Uh, if efficient collaboration between football clubs and the ordinary public municipality social service system? If so, why? If not, why? Mm. And a welfare policy approach. And I don't know if you rec recognize this woman, but it's actually our prime minister, Anna Solberg. In a match against the, the, the national win, the, the, the winner of national tournament for street football uh, teams, they met the governmental team on our national uh, stadium, Ullevål Stadium in Oslo. So it was a, a great occasion, and it also underlined how great political legitimacy uh, this uh, program activity has. This is a former. Uh, coach for the national team, Nor the Norwegian national team, and now he's a, a coach for a football team in Tromsø, in north of Norway. So we did a collaborative study with a research team of seven people, four researchers and three players from three different clubs, as we call them co-researchers. We did some focus interviews, we had uh, some work cafe uh, seminars with mixed local participants from the, the local industry, from the clubs, from the municipalities and others, and of course some literature study and research team seminars along the way, where the, play, the three players in point one there was of course participating. Our findings in one, two, three then. I have to say that our three research questions provide, of course, a basis for, for several conclusions, fair, several uh, sources for new hypotheses, but uh, the overall picture is this. One, you never walk alone. The team, and to be a, a, a part of a team, almost as a family, 
has had great impact. The coach has an enormous impact, a role. And as I said earlier, almost without knowing so, so from him or her, himself. The friendship, the club, the atmosphere, the, the, the proudness of, of wearing the, the suits from the, the, the mother club, uh, the power of being seen, missed if you don't show up on the, on the training field, to be counted on, depend upon, had quite impressive impact on their individual recovering process. The second is all about, it's all about just one life. Life is intertwined. Housing, family, education, work, criminality, semantic and mentalic, and mental health. Who sees the whole picture? My whole life, nobody does in a Norwegian public welfare sector. But the clubs are focused on, uh, on these guys, on these girls, as resources, as players, not as substance abuse people, not problems. And the third is co-creation and that co-production matters. Lots of political rhetoric and bureaucratic declarations, plans, strategies, as several of you had mentioned. Beatles, the Beatles have a song about this, Nowhere Man, making plans for nobody. Doesn't have a point of view. Isn't he a bit like me and you? This has nothing to do with plans or strategies. It has to do with action. So we have few systems and, and a missing ecosystem for collaborative social innovation in Norway. We have plans, we have strategies. So we are concluding that the time seems to be ready for, for more active citizenship, not only plans for it. So what we point on as um, probably further research and development issues and topics is that we argue that communities, politis, politis, uh, pol politi policy makers, sorry, and stakeholders of all kinds should gain a better insight and, and understanding of the value and effect of street football. And maybe that can be scaled over to other burning questions in the, in this case, Norwegian welfare state model, because it's, it's trouble enough. It's, it's trouble enough for everybody. So, so we could gain some insight and some competence from this study and from this field into other uh, welfare uh, society challenges. Uh, and that's exactly what we are going to do, and hopefully we'll do. So a big uh, nationwide Norwegian uh, research and development project is being applied for and will be answered next week. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Ross, and also thank you for being <laughs> just right on, on time. Uh, I would like to open a floor, a floor for questions. Uh, I also have one, but uh, I will wait and, and give opportunity to others. Okay, I, I, will, I will ask my question and if anybody else have additional questions, please uh, uh, just, just uh, mm, uh, do them to, to uh, tell them to Lars. Uh, so my question is regarding this uh, you never walk alone finding which was very uh, very interesting to see. Uh, the question is related to so they experience some support uh, uh, friendship sense of belonging of course to be a part of this kind of initiatives but uh, have you studied or did you see how it is related to their motivation and maintaining motivation during the time to participate in the in the program. And uh, related to that, uh, when we are talking about this kind of very vulnerable groups, my colleague from the social work department always talk about uh, the stigma. 
so certain stigma of being publicly recognized as a person with mental health disorders or uh, substance abuses. What, what is the view from outside, from the community? Is, is this participation in putting them on, uh, on the, under, the, under the, the lights, in a say, or are local community also supporting uh, uh, to them in trying to overcome this possible stigma if it's, uh, if it's present, of course? Yes, thank you. I, I think I'll start with the last because that's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I think these people, these people, the, the participants, the, the team members on these people teams are far beyond the point of afraid of the stigma. They are really, they have been prisoners, many of them. They have been on the street. They have, they have been heroinists. So, so, th so that's not what they're worried about. They're worried about death, not stigma. So, so. Uh, what we have seen examples of is that their parents or the network say, "No, you, you don't. You, you you mustn't start on this team it's because it's it's only for drug addicts." And then they answer, "Well, I'm a drug ad addict, so then uh -huh. that's why they're for me." So they are more pragmatic than than than, yeah, than maybe you and me are and and others. Uh, so that's not a problem. Um, what we see is. They, on the contrary, they are very proud of being a part of, you know, some of your football, proud of being a part. They would be proud to be a, a part of Nottingham Forest or Manchester United or Leeds. Or, and in Norway, we have the same. We are proud to be a part of, of clubs on, the, on the, the top level of Norwegian, you know, league system. And they have the sponsorship on their suits. They have the, the, the logo of, for the, the club. They are training in, on the stadium. Several of the, the matches are on the main stadium. Uh, so so, so uh, stigma is no problem. It's, uh, it's counterwise. It's, it's the, the proudness and the belonging to something. And they, 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 they tell us in the interviews, I, uh, luckily, and for once, I'm part of normal normality of, of a normal setting, because in the in the in the the, the other uh, public service you are in institutions and, or you are in 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 in, in a special you know uh, drug uh, care. Uh, so and they don't like that. They they want to be in an as a normal framework as possible. And this is a really, and that's some of the the success factor in this. You know, we walk alone. The the club content is as normal as you can tell. Okay, thank you. I think that that partly also relate to my second issue. This this answer relates to. Uh, motivation and maintaining motivation during the time so it's well, well kind of, I, 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 yeah one comment on that because we were asking in our study is this success related to football as football because football is football it's not volleyball it's not uh, curling it's not bowling it's not golf yeah and and we asked them that and we try to, to, to come beneath their motivation because one thing is what you say, another thing is often what, how you think and feel. Uh, and so we don't really know, but, but interesting enough, now uh, uh, someone has started uh, some cross-country uh, cross skiing for drug ad abuse and, and mental health. Some has started a riding concept, riding, horse riding and some cycling. So we, we, we want to do a comparative study now. Uh, what is the results on the you never walk alone factor on cross country skiing, cycling and horse riding. So that's uh, a, a, a dimension we are going to study if we get the money next week. Okay, thank you. Good luck with getting the money for this interesting research. So uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, thank you for the presentation. I just want to add something because I'm a great fan of Carlo Wegnausgaard, your uh, uh, great writer. And I saw in his, uh, his biographies, let's say, Min Kamp, uh, because he was a football player when he was young. And uh, then I saw this also perspective about uh, the importance of football when uh, he has some problems in life, the moment when he came back to football and he watched football or plays football, also he, he is more, let's say, relaxed and optimistic and uh, he is aware that he belongs to a community where he, he knows that he could, uh, let's say, be safe uh, uh, related to the, uh, the other, other people, yes. Yes, and it was just a comment. Uh, well, thank you. Idea. Thank you. Well, uh, it has a double, you know, uh, I have to admit, and please don't tell my parents, but, but my first drink, my first beer I had in the, on the football field when I was 15 years old. So, so, <laughs> so football can also be a, a recruitment for, you know, other things. But uh, yeah. on, the, on the pitch and on the, in, on the stadium, we can cry, we can laugh, we can hug, we can, we can do... Uh, things that we as men never do elsewhere so it's a particular place to be we are, we are uh, recording this Lars so we will immediately send your parents <laughs> this admission no <laughs> no worry so thank you thank you for the presentation and uh, for comments and the uh, questions we will move forward with the second uh, second presentation so uh, we have uh, I presume that uh, James Bosak will, uh, would present the paper yeah. of football in the community, investigation into mission alignment, drift in the commodification of the football sports community trust. So James, you have uh, around 10 minutes uh, to, to present. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, just bear with me, because I don't use Zoom very much, so I'm just getting used to it. Uh, yeah, you have just a button uh, lower with, with the same share, yeah. share screen, so yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping that's coming Yeah, we see it. Great. Great. Thank you. I just need to put on okay. to... Oh. Just, just full screen. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, my it's okay. Few problems. Just give me 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah no. No worries. Uh, uh... My screen's just playing up a little bit. There we go, got it. Is that great? Okay. So, um, thank you for allowing me to present today. Uh, the presentation that uh, Mike and myself have put together is all about football in the community and investigation into mission alignment and drift. So, what we're gonna look at over the next 10 minutes is quite a lot, so some of the slides will go through relatively quickly. Uh, we're going to look at the concept of a sports community, uh, sports trust. We're going to look at the rationale behind the research that we've started uh, in terms of kind of a conceptual model. We're going to look at the tensions that these uh, charitable organisations are facing in terms of reconciling the difference between mission and market. We're going to look at some of those, uh, the financial growth in real and diversifications that these, these organizations are going through. And again, those tensions that those diversifications are creating. We're going to look at the conception model that we're starting to put together and, and trying to develop. And then finally, in terms of a kind of conclusion, is our next step because uh, the, the research we've done so far really is more conceptual in nature because it's kind of been put on hold by uh, the impacts of COVID. So, in terms of getting started then, uh, what are these kind of football community sports trusts? Well, football in the UK has had a long history of civic engagement, um, but really it wasn't until the mid 80s when strategies started to get formulated around community engagement and community-based programs. Most of this was driven by the presence of hooliganism in football in the UK, and the football clubs were putting together football and community programs to try and curb those kind of uh, deviant 
activities within the football fandom area. Uh, this created a few problems, uh, mainly around the fact that although there was a, a clear civic desire to improve those relations between fans and clubs, there was a lot of confusion around who actually was responsible for this program, uh, who was meant to be delivering it, its impacts at the community level, uh, and the you know was there actually a genuine desire to improve community uh, engagement and, and create a community ethos? So really, around about 2009, uh, charitable organisations called Community Sports Trust were started to pop up in and around football in the UK, uh, and the, but these were directly associated to the, the, the professional club. So organisations such as Manchester United. Chelsea set up a separate charitable organisation that was designed to deliver sport in the community. This had quite a lot of benefits in terms of structural, financial and strategic independence, but it allowed the community trust to draw on the, the benefits of being associated with the football club. Uh, these new trusts though were very much geared towards driving forward community cohesion, uh, education and health uh, and you know these the benefits of separating the two out uh, became very clear early on and what happened particularly from around about 2012-13 the this community of trust really kind of snowballed in terms of every single club now in the Premier League and the Football League has one of these community trusts that's linked to it and just, just to reiterate though, that these football community sports trusts are separate entities. Uh, they have their own boards, they have their own management structures, they have their own sources of income. They are completely independent structures from the football clubs. But the link is there to try and create a better community provision, as it were. So what's the rationale behind the research uh, that we're looking at here? Uh, well, fundamentally, uh, what's happened within the UK particularly is that there's been significant declines in spending by local authorities uh, in terms of the austerity measures brought in by the Conservative coalition from around about 2010 onwards. So we're quite interested in seeing who's been trying to fill this void that's been left behind. It was quite surprising really that although local authorities have seen significant cuts uh, in funding um, in and around £215 million pounds a year, the, the football community trusts have seen significant increases in their income. So from around about 2014, uh, their total income was only around about £82 million pounds per year. That has now increased to over £136 million pounds in 2018. These organisations have uh, increase their provision as well. So moving away simply from providing sports activities, now they're very much involved in things like tackling physical inactivity, uh, supporting people with uh, drug dependencies, uh, trying to make community, improve community cohesion as well. So that their, their mission is increased and so is their income. So we, we were quite interested in trying to find out is you know, does this expansion create tensions with the, in these community trusts? Is there a drive or a movement away from kind of that social, civic, community engagement to more of a engaging with funders to try and increase the income of these organisations? So there's questions there about kind of the commodification of these trusts and whether or not uh, they're now delivering programmes for the community or programs for their fund, the funding partners that they've engaged with. So, you know, these tensions come from a, a wide range in, of, of sources. And, you know, this is just a, a basic literature review that we've done. But fundamentally, what we're, what we're arguing is, is the Tuckman and Chang point that basically, as their revenue streams grow, um, these organisations start to adopt practices that are more in line with for-profit organisations, despite their primary function being to engage and support uh, the local communities that they represent. 
so we're, we're really interested in that kind of tension to drive social impact but at the same time to uh, the tension with the drive to generate revenue and in terms of those tensions you know they're very broad so you know just doing a, a quick view of these accounts these are all the funding organizations that are involved in providing resource to these, these uh, community sports trusts so the premier league's heavily involved but then of course there's donations local authorities uh, specific um, programs that are designed to get more people active such as active partnerships school sports partnerships so the reason I put that in there is just to highlight the amount of tension and directions that these organizations are being called in. And, you know, just to really highlight the growth, uh, you know, what we've seen particularly from around about 2012, 2013, is significant income growth uh, from these organizations. Uh, you know, the Premier League's seen a slight decline. That's actually gone back up again quite significantly in the last round of annual reports. And even down there in the Football League 2, you know, they, they have seen their income double over the last uh, four years. Okay, some winners and some losers, you know, you know West Ham Foundation has gone up by nearly 280%, Huddersfield Foundation has gone up by nearly 160%. So these, these organisations have experienced significant increases in income. So how does this all work? Well, like I said, you know, these organizations are socially orientated. How do we kind of track and understand that, that social impact that they're creating? Uh, well, we have the Charity Commission that regulates and regu re regulates all charitable organizations and all, our, all the community trusts I've spoken to are registered charities. So they have to explain the what, the who, the where, and the how the charity, you know, what the charity does, who the help, how the charity helps, and where the charity helps. They also have to produce financial histories such as income expenditure, accounts, annual reports. Now the annual reports are a good source of information because trustees have to report on, on how they're doing. Governing document uh, in terms of uh, the charitable objectives, so that in other words they're proving their charitable organizations, assets, assets and liabilities, book and then the trustees. And what that's all designed to do really is to show the social return on investment uh, in terms of their impact and measuring their social return rather than just their economic outcomes. And the idea, I suppose, for behind this is that we're trying to show the social value that these organizations can produce in terms of health, well-being, and a sense of community around what they do. So just quickly, uh, Mike, uh, myself and the other colleagues that are involved have looked at kind of models in place and we're looking to adapt one by himself and, and Rory, Rory really Duff in terms of how these social enterprises can be pulled, pulled in, different org in different directions. So, you know, from a charitable orientation, have they moved to a more commercial orientation, which is driven more by market and traditional for profit, <coughs> pardon me, or are they still non-profit ethos and motive and more about socializing? So we've kind of You use this as a place. And we created kind of uh, do they have you can, and what, I'm what sorry was James, you can run one minute more. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm nearly I've nearly done to be honest. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and what what the model is, is trying to show uh, in the sense here is that artifacts, evidence, outcomes and impacts will tilt the spectrum that these organisations are on and tilt them towards one direction or the other. So it's not kind of like we're saying that uh, 
all these organizations will be commercially orientated or charitably or orientated is that they are being pulled in different directions those tensions are mounting and that uh, we need to know what sort of impact they're having in other words are they creating opportunities for the local community or are they just creating opportunities to attract the funding so like i said it's conceptual in nature at the moment uh, but what are our next steps well uh, just to kind of finish off what we're looking at is to build on this conceptual model uh, to find out what their orientations actually are and the challenges that they, they face in kind of trying to reconcile this kind of mission in terms of what they're designed to do, i.e. their charitable objectives and their community engagement and the market in terms of where their funding is coming from. We also plan to do kind of open interviews, in-depth uh, open interviews with the community trusts to pick up uh, and we're going to use kind of a, a visual tool to get them to a place where they think they are on that continuum and challenge them about you know how they're moving around that, that continuum uh, and in terms of the structure what we're aiming to do as well one senior board member and one senior manager to gain their different perspectives so the managers may see that these organizations slightly differently to the board members and then finally you know we aim to collect this evidence uh, through the artifacts that they produce, data of outcome of, and impacts, as well as the, the world views that may, behind, behind, sorry, that may lay behind the rhetoric. So that's a very quick result of tour of uh, where are we at currently. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. I see that uh, Mihai had raised his hand in, in, the, in the participants list. So, Mihai, do you have a question? Um, actually, it, it, it was uh, to Lars. It was during the, the previous presentation. Ah, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, it, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm still here. Yeah. Floor is, floor is open for questions and, and comments uh, to James' presentation, if you have them. I have a question. Yeah. James, uh, nice to see you and meet you, even if this is an odd way to, to, to meet up. But could, could you uh, go back to the, 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 the model with this, uh, this balance chart? That's right. Yep. Uh, uh, have you been studying these trusts long enough to see if they are moving uh, or have they found their balance point in this model? So there's, there's real kind of limited research that's been done in this area. There's probably only one or two papers that we've been able to locate in terms of uh, football community trusts. So in terms of the balance and where these organizations are, the simple answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike and myself have an inclination that a lot are being driven towards the commercial end uh, of activity, you know, with showing how they're returning um, on the investment that the funding funders have provided, rather than actually are they creating social impacts at the community level. Um, so, um, our kind of, I don't want to say hypothesis, that's the wrong word, but our kind of feeling at the moment is that they're being driven more towards the commercial aspect mm -hmm. rather than being driven by their charitable mission. Uh, but we, we, we don't know because it's been limited research done yeah. in this area. And that's what we, when we do our empirical study, that's what we'd, we'd like to find out really. Daniel, may I do it now? Yeah, 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 of course. Thanks. Um, well, looking to the, 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 the graphic here, James, um, when you mentioned commercial orientation, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear. Is this concerning the organizational behavior or does it concern the purpose, the mission of the organization? Because uh, it's orientation, um, it, it's kind of um, ambiguous. Yeah, so what we're trying to get at here is actually what, what the organization is is doing uh, so in other words are they chasing funding 
uh, to increase the revenue streams for the organization? And is that funding linked to uh, providers who might actually be pulling the organization away from what it's primarily set up to do? So a lot of these, well, all these community trusts were set up to engage with communities and specific issues those communities have. A lot of these funding partners actually provide funding, but that, but that might draw them away. And what we're trying to discuss there is that commercial orientation may be pulling them away from their primary purpose as an organization. Uh, so like I said, you know, away from the community they're trying to engage with to one that engages more with the funding partners to get more income. Uh, I guess, I guess as well, what I'd say is that kind of what, what we, what we might see is that the, the clubs, the trusts are moving more towards achieving the um, the outputs of the easy to reach of the hard to reach yeah. rather than the hard yeah. to reach of the hard to reach so in other words then they've, they've you know they're moving from from meeting goals that are aspects of, of of people that are struggling to the ones that kind of are easy to sort of count yeah i absolutely agree with that i mean you see in the low you know talking about sports development in the uk you know, why have our participation levels not shifted over the last 10 years, even though there's been significant investment? Well, the hard to reach are very hard to reach, like mine. So, uh, you know, do they chase the funding that hits those easier targets as well? That's, that's quite an interesting point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James, for the presentation and, and comment, comments and answers. Uh, if we do not have any new questions, we will go to the next uh, presentation. And the next presentation is sustainable value creation entrepreneurial orientations in the football industry. So, uh, Michael, the floor is okay. yours. Thanks. All right, let's uh, work out this technology. Uh, Can everybody see that outline there? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, but in, in a small... Yeah, I'll in, make it bigger in a minute. Box. I just want to show people this. Can see people see the background there? Ah. I, might, I, might li I might live in Manchester, <laughs> but I'm a West Bromwich <laughs> Albion supporter. And uh, <laughs> uh, we have a Croatian manager. So... Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my... see, I see the jersey. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, okay. This is going to be a... Um, a whistle stop tour. Let me turn off my screen if I can so I can just see the slides. Okay. So this is a paper that we've just had published in an entrepreneurship journal. But it's basically sort of looking at the um the tensions that, that exist in professional football. And I guess our our angle for coming at this is in terms of a social enterprise agenda is that the the ownership of football clubs is contested and so therefore what we want to do is we want to draw attention to that contested notion of ownership and actually come up with some of the things that we come out with in the paper that suggests that um, there's, there's more than one way of looking at a professional football club that is privately owned so um, our purpose is what we're going to do. What we do in the paper is we look and examine strategic, economic, culture, and social capital, um, analysing the legal owners, which are the entrepreneurs we call them of the football clubs, and the implications for moral owners. Now, these are the supporters, and so therefore there's a claim that um, supporters are the moral owners of football clubs, and that football clubs are a social product. Are a social business. So it, our question is not if they create value, but um, whether that value is productive or destructive. Our methodology was to look at the top two professional divisions in the English football pyramid. So that's 44 clubs in the top two leagues. And we were looking at secondary textual data, which means what we were looking at is kind of like newspaper reports, we were looking at club statements. We were looking at the, the blogs and websites that fans create. So what we're looking for is to capture all a kind of huge account and narrative of kind of 
club and supporter as to where um, opinions lie between the two. <clears throat> this is just to show that the, the pyramid of the professional game is the top four levels and then it's uh, non-professional below that so you can see where we positioning this research. So the literature in the, fo the football literature suggests that football um, is a social product, economic in basis but social in nature and for hundreds of thousands of years it's been a fabric of society but it, it, it's this change of a, of a commercialization um, and commodification that's coming into the game that's questioning the way in which the game is going in recent years. So it's becoming a branch of the entertainment industry rather than something to do with its uh, social home. How this all kind of holds together is that the English FA, um, from when they first developed the rules of the game way back in 1888, when the first league began, was that um, the way in which football clubs were structured were as social enterprises. So um, there was a cap on the dividends of 15% paid up on share. Um, a share will not be subdivided. No club company shall make any bonus issue without the written consent of the council. And, um, and directors could not receive any remuneration. So therefore, everything was reinvested back into the club in terms of the investment of where these organisations were going. However, something happened in 1983 which changed UK football forever. And it was the um, instigation of Irvin Scholar, who was the owner um, who floated Tottenham on the stock market. What he was trying to do was raise investment so that he could create an all-seater stadium. He also wanted to create a fashion brand and a restaurant within the football club. And so he um, requested um, to the FA um, if he could circumvent Rule 34 and be able to pay directors so that he could attract investors into the football club. The FA agreed to that and have never explained their decision and shortly after Rule 34 was abolished. But Rule 34 was really important in terms of the way in which the spirit of the game um, was, was developed. And these are the sort of I mean, they, may, they are men, old men, who are with traditional owners of football clubs, the custodians, they're stewards of the game, plurality, local supporters. And it, there was a degree of trust that these were, were, were sort of reinvesting their profits back into the different leagues. And indeed, the, the guy in the middle now is, is at Arsenal. And that the concept of Arsenal was of custodianship and plurality of ownership in central to the club's charter. The Arsenal Supporters Trust sees custodianship as the responsibility of all Arsenal shareholders to look after the club's values and keep them safe for future generations. So this was kind of a shared concept, I think, across the football leagues, that there was this kind of sense that directors were looking out for the supporters. But this was all pre-83. What's happened since post-83 football in England has meant that we've now seen a surge of overseas owners coming into the game. And what this brings with it is that sort of globalization, commodification, commercialization challenge, which is moving football away from its cultural heritage. But as we see here, Kennedy and Kennedy state that kind of like there's this community identity, there is a sense of moral ownership of football clubs. And it isn't whose name is above the director's door. It's about the supporters and it's about where the supporters are, are engaging with their club. So football without fans is nothing. And there's a passion that comes with supporting your football club that in recent years has really been challenged with, with the way in which the commodification has gone. We've seen demonstrations all the time in football clubs. There's a huge amount of different stories that are sort of leading, leading us to sort of really question the way in which 
our clubs, and it is our clubs, the supporters are being torn by the way in which um, commercialization is coming into the game. So our analysis was to use something from the entrepreneurship literature to analyze this notion of value creation. And it's mentioned quite often within the, the entrepreneurship literature that there is this sense of value creation in what entrepreneurs do. And in this model here, we can see the recognition of value in this kind of like the entrepreneurial process. So from these models, we see this sense of there is kind of four different types of capital. And, and the notion is, is that there's some sort of balance here to create sustainable value creation, whatever that is. What we then did is to then plot the, the main purpose and orientation of the different types of entrepreneurs in both the Premier League and the Football League, the division below. And as we can see, there's a, a movement that there are more political orientation and investor orientation entrepreneurs in football than there are fan orientation and local orientation. And what we also map here with, across these two is, these, um, is this difference between those that are in grey, those that are in white out of black, and then they're in those that are black out of white. And what we're trying to do there is highlight the tensions that exist in those football clubs as those squares represent how, how much disenchantment there is from the supporters in those clubs. And as you can see, there is a fair bit of disenchantment. There's a couple of examples of how this kind of pans out. One of them is Hull City, where the owner has tried to change the club from being called Hull City Association Football Club, the name that it had since 1904, into Hull Tigers. And so there was a demonstration by the supporters, which kind of like there's a little flag of the, a little um, banner there that says down with this sort of thing. We don't want this thing happening in our football club. Our club is a club, it's not a brand. Also in Cardiff City, um, a new owner came in and changed the club colours from blue to red. He subsequently reverted back to blue again, but this is after years of protest within the club itself. So in terms of, of, of looking at kind of like an overarching feel of where this is going, is that this table represents our outsiders and insiders. Now the insiders being the more traditional uh, owners of football clubs and the outsiders, the, the new overseas investors. And what we see is, is that there's an imbalance. 70% of clubs in the Premier League are owned by outsiders. 62% in the Football League are owned by outsiders. And what this means is, is that there's an equilibrium imbalance from plus five of in, insider ownership, of, of, that's a measure of happiness, if you like, to a measure of disenchantment in the minus nine from the overseas. So we see this kind of this imbalance. And um, that's essentially our paper, is to say that this opening up of the professional game has seen the overgrazing on strategic and economic capital at the expense of social and cultural capital, where this detachment, uh, disenchantment and protest exists. And um, we can, we, we're trying to influence a call for um, a, um, a new investigation by government into football ownership. Uh, to highlight this existence that um, things are not quite right. And, and the supporter is a good barometer as a key, stalk, st a key stakeholder in, in the football club. Um, so this zeitgeist at the moment for, for external outsider um, support, um, movement away from supporters and from local owners to more um, global owners uh, to bring huge amounts of money into the game, it, it causes um, such problems. And uh, that's the end. Thank you. Great, great, Michael. Uh, thank you for being on time. Thank you for a great presentation. So the floor is open once again for questions and comments.
I have a question. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, Pastor Bibo, I am uh, wondering a uh, very interesting research in the, since the United Kingdom is the inventor of football and uh, they have such a long tradition and uh, saying that um, my question is uh, to what extent can a Liverpool fan identify with a team in which there is no English player? <laughs> But the greatest names in the world. Is that anymore a Liverpool team or is that uh, just a branded Liverpool team, uh, faking uh, colors and so on? And what is the link between the feeling of community being proud of some of their home born uh, players, uh, English born players, and they are full of uh, Brazilian players? Uh, global players uh, who don't play for money and don't play for anything more than money. Yeah, it's really interesting. It is that commodification, isn't it? So the commodification is actually on the pitch as much as what it is in terms of the ownership of the game. Because I suppose the opening up of, of markets changes the way in, uh, in which who, who buys in and, and how, much, um, how much money that's come into the English game. It's, it's a huge amount to to then it, it attracts it attracts people from everywhere doesn't it the, the the Italian league was the same sort of in the 90s when when there was more money in the Italian game and the English game mm -hmm. um, it seemed to sort of, sort of it's the money seems to move around a little bit until it came to England and I think it's 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 more settled in England M maybe that's because of the the ownership model in England being different to what it was in Italy and Spain mm -hmm. that can grow and grow and grow and maximize more income because of its private ownership model rather than social ownership. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mike, may I ask you to go back to your presentation? I think the not the last slide, but the one before the last one. Yeah. This one? Uh, oh, this I one? See. You need to share the screen, screen once ah. again. Yes, I don't see the screen. Uh, was it? Uh, is it this one? Mm. Um, this is the first one. It should be uh, the, the last before. The last before last. Yes. That one? The last one. That one? No, no, we, we are not seeing anything moving because uh, I think that you, you didn't ah, share a full screen. screen. Paused. Yeah. Uh, resume share, sorry. Yeah. Now we so, see different slides, so, Mihai. Yeah, no, it, it, it was right, the one before the last one. Sorry, let me... Uh, let me go to the last one. The okay. last one here? Yes. The one before the last one? Yes. <laughs> yes I think so. Um, yep. Yeah. Well, I can see here. Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. um, not this one. Not this one, yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Oh, okay, yes, this one. I can see here, looking at social implication, um, football fans are the majority stakeholders in the football industry, but they are rather underrepresented in the English football because of the private ownership of the football clubs. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, um, it may be um, just because it sounds like very familiar. I had a discussion with Rory um, on, on the wording, basically. Um, yeah. Football uh, fans, um, the, common, the, the common property, um, it would be a, a, a club which would be community owned, you know, by the members um, of the, the fans. It, yeah. would be, it, it would be also considered as being a private um, ownership or do you consider private only ah. to individuals? Right. Sorry. Yes. In terms of private ownership, we mean um, owned by individuals rather than being owned by 
um, a body representing a group. Yeah, yeah. This is why I had the same discussion with Rory explaining that from a legal perspective, even when it's a co common collective uh, property, if it's um. about individuals, then it's, it should be considered um, private, but uh, we, we need Still to clarify private, the then. meaning of the wording. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't travel well, does it, into... Uh, into Eastern Europe. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we still mean um, something that private owned is in the private sector in mm -hmm. terms of a sector where you have private sector, public sector, and um, a third sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. not in the, not in the third sector. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's, uh, okay. that's good to clari clarify. Um, I think in a, in a sense of time that we already only have 15 minutes left to the end of the session we need to move forward to the last uh, presentation so the last presentation is the icing on the cake social responsibility yeah. voice and support and engagement at the heart of uk professional uh, football so please okay. uh, once Back again share my screen again share screen icing on the cake yeah Okay. Thank so, you. Can we everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this paper is kind of work in progress, really, and um, it was built on a rejected submission to a sport um, journal, where um, we we've subsequently added a second sort of wave of research that that might support the paper in some depth so basically wh where we're coming from with this is a, is around social responsibility um or could be referred to as corporate social responsibility in the literature but yeah. that's the literature that we've gone to to situate the context of looking at social responsibility and with this sense that social responsibility is about sort of positively addressing un sdgs um, and the importance to the future of society and the planet. So we see football clubs as arguably socially responsible businesses, quasi-social businesses, um, as kind of referred to in the last sort of presentation, that, that, they, that, that is back, we're back to this kind of contested notion of, of, of football as a, uh, an organisation. So um, our research question is, how do English professional football clubs deliver on their social responsibility? Um, within the social responsibility literature, there's all sorts of, of aspects and angles that sort of from one researcher to another claims is where the sort of the key issues lie. But there's this general sense that ecological, community, social and stakeholder initiatives are all in the mix. So these are the ones that we've sort of tried to, to focus on. And, and looking at the, the CSR literature, it really suggests that organisations in the private sector have their legal responsibilities. And the title of the paper really comes from this idea of the icing on the cake, which um, Archie Carroll refers to as the discretionary responsibilities. But actually, I think in terms of future research, I mean, there's something in looking at um, social businesses such as football clubs in this notion of kind of what is discretionary or not but that's another paper so um our methodology was to look at um the english premier league football clubs as stakeholders and the data that i've got in that at the, at the moment within these slides is a couple of years old it needs updating again um, but then we move to a secondary um, level where we've looked at an, a single case study. So in terms of the different areas then, so we've initially looked at the um, ecological initiatives and whether football clubs had environmental policies that would cover things like low carbon waste management, water, lighting, renewables, carbon and transport initiatives and things like that. In the Football League at the time of the study, there was only two clubs out of the 20 clubs in the Premier League that had policies or any connection with any of these um, initiatives. 
in looking at the explicit community um, social initiatives and the engagement um, with um, outreach into the community, schools, projects, disability, local communities, that kind of thing, around this health and wellbeing agenda. And thankfully, in line with the, uh, the conversation so far on, on the day in the seminar, is really that every club is involved in this. Um, and it's largely by, from what James was presenting, is that every club has externalised um, this into its own charity. Um, the third area around stakeholder initiatives is about sort of um, the stake, different stakeholders. So we initially looked at within the football clubs, the policies around anti-slavery, child labour policy, inequality policies, that kind of thing. And half of the clubs had initiatives around those. And then more about the supporter, start moving now towards kind of thinking about the supporter and um, all clubs have a supporter charter in terms of looking out for um, ticketed information, club membership, um, ground regulations, um, stewardship, um, catering and complaints procedures and all sorts of things like that. And the majority of clubs have those supporter charters. The last areas that we really looked at in terms of this stakeholder engagement is back to the supporter again. And in two ways, the fan is, is engaged with the club. One of them is through what they call fans forums, which is meetings of different representative bodies of different uh, supporter groups, such as disability, age, family, local residents, season ticket holders. Um, they meet with representatives of the club, club secretary, um, corporate media relations, communications, ticketing people within meetings and there was half of the clubs had fans forums. The other aspect is the support and liaison officer. Now these are people that are employed by the club to be a bridge between the club and the supporter and to um, help support the dialogue between the two and the majority of clubs in the Premier League had those in place. So our tentative findings were that a sense that engagement in ecological initiatives is low, engagement in social initi initiatives is in its entire league, but that's because of the externalised football community sports trust as, as James presented. Um, so it's engagement in stakeholder initiatives is high, but, but really is it because you've got um, the, um, the support liaison officer and you've got fans forums. But is there a notion of whether that engagement is meaningful or not? So that brought us on to the challenge of meaningful engagement, which is something that comes up in the UEFA club licensing and financial fair play regulation, regulations that stipulates that football clubs in Europe need to show meaningful engagement with their supporters. So we started to look at fans forums in a bit more depth. So UEFA suggests that this meaningful engagement is to, to ensure proper and constructive discourse between fans and clubs. It's about improving stakeholder relations and transparency, and it's about appreciating the supporter as more of a partner in the organisation, a co-producer, we would suggest, and a co-creator of the product. We chose Arsenal Football Club to do a single case study on because Arsenal are one of the big six in English football, um, initially established as a mutual in 1886 when they formed, but soon transferred into a limited liability company. Um, what was interesting about Arsenal, I'll come on to, is that they, 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 uh, public, they public access to their minutes of the, of the fans forum is why we chose them. But they've moved from a, a football club that was owned by in, in a PLC by um, lots of different owners to in, in recent times 100% owned by Arsenal Holdings Limited. Arsenal Holdings Limited is 100% owned by KSE. KSE is subsequently owned 100% by Stanley Cronkier. And he's a US based um, sports um, entrepreneur. And um, Interestingly, the Arsenal Supporters Trust, that is a cooperative, um, they had six shares in Arsenal Football Club and a place on the board before 2018. 
So 10% of the club was owned by a few thousand small shareholders and Arsenal Supporters Trust represented the whole body of, the, of their interests. So it was a multi-stakeholder quasi-social enterprise was Arsenal prior to 2018. And the board itself, um, it's suggested by Arsenal Supporters Trust that the Arsenal board and major shareholders were part of its plural ownership structure and custodian approach where they ploughed the profits back into the club and they were all lifelong Arsenal fans. Um, and everything was kind of like, you know, reinvested back in. So it was a social enterprise. Ma but then, Michael, since, you, sorry, you have one, one minute more. One minute? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So since 2018, KSC amassed enough shares to buy the majority, the majority out. And so they now have full control. Arsenal is owned by one person now, not anybody else. The £557 million debt that was secured to buy out all the rest of the shares was actually then put onto the accounts of, of Arsenal Football Club. Um, Cronker himself has a very low profile. And what we've done here is to look at um, the, the, the seven years of Fans Forum's minutes, 200,000 words. And I looked to see what kind of things were discussed in those meetings. And it was all logic, logistical issues. It was all about ticketing. It was all about kind of getting access to things. It was about travel arrangements. It was about facilities. It wasn't about meaningful engagement. It wasn't about co-owning the football club. It wasn't about allowing the supporter any proper say within the football club. And so within the Fans Forum minutes itself, there's questions that are asked by members of the Fans Forum about the owner. Can he turn up? Can he engage with fans? And, and the response is from the football club that he respects and he, he is engaged, but he doesn't turn up. And, and so, you know, there's questions that very rarely pop up in the Fans Forum's meeting minutes. I guess it's because those minutes are, are cleansed. And, and the word custodian, that is so much a part of the Arsenal way, appears once in a whole set of minutes from eight years of fans' discussions. So I really do contest whether there's meaningful engagement is happening in these football clubs. And those are our conclusions. So we're going to look at future research in different ways, but, but I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd sort of put, pitch something that might... might that others might want to take in other directions to look at the same sort of thing in different contexts. So, thank you. Okay, Th thank you so much for, uh, for the presentation. And it was, it was quite interesting in Croatia also, we see often discussions about uh, fans engagement and a meaningful way how two fans can be engaged in a, uh, in a football clubs and it, you know, goes from, uh, one aspect of potentially buying a shares and becoming a part of the club, two aspects on, of informal communication, different kind of uh, ad hoc pressures and ad hoc actions, uh, etc. So we have a couple of more minutes to discuss and conclude. Uh, please, the floor is open for the questions and comments on this last presentation. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, very interesting, this concept of moral ownership uh, as, uh, as uh, a, a theme that you also could uh, address to the second uh, presentation you had, because this, this, this uh, dynamic uh, between the, the commercial and the, the moral uh, ownership uh, was a theme in both presentations, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my brother is an Arsenal fan. He's living in the south of Norway. I think he, 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 his uh, approach to Arsenal uh, is just as strong as if he was a Londoner. Yeah, I think his place, he, he's placing Arsenal in his heart equal to his family, more or less. And he, it's yep. a lifelong 
he's been my brother for 59 years and I always remember him. He's my big brother as an Arsenal fan. He has an Arsenal scarf, Arsenal, you know. Uh, so uh, how strongly intertwined is this concept uh, for moral ownership fans as a local phenomenon? Or could you actually see th that we have moral ownership globally because uh, the, the identity and the, 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 the emotions connected to the clubs yeah. are in fact strong also absolutely, other absolutely Lars Abs absolutely and I think there's a wonderful paper just in moral ownership and actually looking at it from a local and global kind of opinion because as you say there are, there are now because of the globalization of, of, of football everywhere um, there, are, there are supporters all over the world in, in every club. I noticed as well in my local club, Stockport County, there's a little pocket of China that is a, a really big follower of Stockport County because the team visited there a number of years ago. But, um, but yes, that, that, that belonging to a, a sense of geography isn't necessarily, lo isn't necessarily now locally driven. It, it, it is a global geography to uh, you know th there's a narrative in this sort of community enterprise literature that talks about geographical community enterprises and enterprises of community of interest so i think this kind of community of interest angle would be really interesting in that kind of moral ownership area okay do we have other comments Questions at the end of this session. Uh, Mikhail, please, m microphone. Um, I, as, a, as, a as a practitioner converted to academics, um, I feel like a, a practical academic, uh, as, as it was mentioned before. Um, I really feel like um, this um, social responsibility issue um, especially when referring to, to football as, as a global phenomenon, it's extremely, extremely relevant. And I feel like um, we, should, we should think about, you know, speaking in terms of um, active research, we should think about a, a proactive approach, um, trying to um, de-marketize, de that there is a marketization process of, of, of football in, in sports, but football, it, it's so relevant. So in this respect, um, making, making the football clubs, um, transforming them into community ownership um, um, institution, I think that it, it would be a great, um, great uh, avenue for uh, activism in, in the sense of um, um, transforming sport into, again, um, a community issue, not, not really the, the industry as, as, as I saw in one of the pictures there. Absolutely, I think there's there's, um, there's there's probably more there's more community ownership um, in in Italy, Spain, Germany, Greece, Finland uh, than what there is in in the UK certainly. Um, and it, a study looking at kind of how how and what level can community um, ownership moved to. I mean, we had the Champions League final a few years ago between Dortmund and Munich, um, which were both, you know, um, community-owned football clubs. Um, it's a challenge, though, isn't it, to sort of to 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 use our narrative onto the rest of, of football to have that kind of sense that these are social businesses and promote. And, and, and investigate that. Yep. Um, yeah, it certain, certainly is. Uh, so we are at the end of this session, a couple of minutes late, but it, it's fine. It's great to have uh, topics to keep on conversation going and to discover and rediscover these important themes. So in the I end, I was going to be. Um, yeah. Daniel, I, thought, I thought it was going to be a lot longer than that because these are about sort of half an hour presentations that I rammed into 10 minutes. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, were, we, we were very limited on, on time and I really 
certainly hope so that we will have an opportunity to speak again on these kind of topics uh, via workshop round table or presentation session and emails conference or something so i i think that this is the work and this is the conversation that we need to keep keep on uh, nowadays nowadays when we gather when we spark some interest and in communication the all four presentations were, were great and i really really enjoyed them you know they discovered different facets of uh, football and its uh, innovative elements, social responsibility, different aspects of uh, work of organizations in the community and the community itself. So I want to thank you all for participation in this session and uh, we will continue with our program in um, 10 minutes, is it Mikhail, with a national session about social entrepreneurship and sports in uh, Romania, which we we also have different interesting speakers. And I would like to add here, um, yeah, inviting you to, to join also the domestic session, uh, the fact that we are trying to make a logical connection. Um, the first presentation would be uh, made by, by Ashoka. I see that Ovidio is already here. As I mentioned a couple of times already today, they, they had um, a nice mapping exercise of the entrepreneurship initiatives in sports. So it's, it's kind of a um, logic connection with what we've been talking the, the whole day. And then we have also um, Special Olympics with um, the presentation of their, their activities in Romania and also two, um, two projects, entrepreneurship, uh, social entrepreneurship projects using sports in, um, in a certain communities. So very, very um, concrete examples showing uh, the multitude of uh, social benefits sports would bring into the communities. So I hope to see you back in 10 minutes. See you all. Thank you once again.
Oh, great. Um, we are about to start um, the last workshop during the event. As uh, mentioned in the program, we are about to find out more about um, some um, projects um, using sports. Um, in kind of social entrepreneurship in initiatives or um, vice versa, whatever. Uh, and I'm glad to see that at least two of the presenters that were here. Um, the first uh, today is um, Ovidiu. Ovidiu is representing Ashoka, Romania. And uh, as being mentioned a couple of times today, um, they had um, a very nice initiative. They've been uh, trying to map on the social entrepreneurship um, initiatives uh, using sports um, all over Romania. I think that this is a project which was done quite this year, so it, it's, it's quite recent. But uh, we will have the chance to, to get more details uh, directly from Ovidio to see your video. Thanks for having me here. Okay, so you should um, share with us uh, your presentation. Okay, okay. I can start. I, I, I thought you were making an introduction for all of those who are going to share their perspectives today, but yeah. So thank you for having me here and uh, nice to see uh, some familiar faces as well here. I'll share my screen, screen now just uh, as a base for the conversation, but I'm not going to go through all the details here. But basically, so uh, some background uh, and why we as Ashoka are interested in the field. Uh, Ashoka is an international organization who works in the field of social entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship, and we're searching and so selecting Ashoka fellows, these kind of social entrepreneurs work in different fields to solve social problems. Um, and because in Ashoka, uh, I found this, uh, Ashoka fellows working in, in the field of sports and because I had uh, some sort of background and connection with sport, I said, okay, let's see uh, what happens in Romania in terms of people who use sport to produce social good. Because uh, if you're from Romania, you know that the conversation around sport is usually not about how uh, sport can be used to solve a social problem, but rather in terms of the performances that we have. So that's how we partnered with the Calvon to get the perspective of peers working in the field of sports uh, about who they consider as being change makers, people who use sport to produce social good. Um, and we didn't introduce any definition. We wanted to see what's the perception of the field because that's the most important side. Um, and what I wanted to present today are two perspectives. One is how do these people look like? Uh, and the second part is what are the challenges that they are facing? I'm going to skip a couple of things, but basically, um, in terms of the people that we had in the in our mapping and in our process, there were a couple of things that I, I observed. First things first is that when people think of uh, change makers, social entrepreneurs in the field of sports, it's kind of something new. And I observed this while having interviews with people. It's not something that they usually think of, think of sport being used to produce social impact. It's not something common for them. So it took some time for them to also nominate people, to think of people who might you know, fit into this category. Uh, um, category. Most of the people nominated or people who, who are considered as change makers come from bigger cities. And that happens because usually people associate using sports for social good with the notoriety that people have or how well they are known. And people coming from bigger cities, they usually are more known or have initiatives who are more known. Also in terms of um, all the profile of the people that we mapped, most of the people over 66% are men and the others are women. And even in terms of people that they nominate, both men and women nominate more men. So in Romania, I would say that uh, if we think of sport for social good, people associate more men with this field and um, regardless of the, the area in, in, in where they, they come from. Uh, so this is, this is something about their profile and how people perceive uh, this field of sport for social good. 
Um, and yeah, for sure, there's a gender inequality in terms of our perception uh, around that. And um, more, more, more of the people that were nominated, uh, they were nominated because their initiatives were some, in some way, well known at regional level or at national level. Okay, uh, and then this is something also interesting uh, regarding, you know, uh, how people perceive the project and the impact that they have. Uh, there's a slight difference in terms of the impact that projects done by men and by women uh, have. And usually the projects and the initiatives that women have where they use sports are more focused on local or regional um, areas rather than the initiatives that are led by men, which are more, let's say, um, at national scale. Um, that's, that's some sort of a difference in terms of how do they look in, as, as social entrepreneurs or change makers in Romania. Um, and then the, the second aspect that I would like to talk to you apart from this profile is about also the impact that they have. And as I said, usually um, the, the, the people who come from bigger cities, they tend to have initiatives which have impact at national or international scale, but at least national. And those who are who have more local or regional uh, impact, they're also more known locally, they are focused more on local uh, social problems, uh, and they are not connected between them. Um, another in uh, interesting aspect, which is, it was, it's really valuable for us to think in, in terms of the projects that we have and, they, and how do they actually manage to achieve impact. If we think of, you know, social entrepreneurs, and their, their purpose, purpose is to achieve social impact we're seeing that most of the initiatives that manage to have social impact, they do that by being by having this grit of perseverance and staying um, and solve uh, and finding solutions for that social problem for a long period of time. So there are people who after 20 years, they manage to have a national uh, impact and to stay at that level. Uh, so it's, it's, it's also about the grit. You need to stay, uh, to be present around the social problem and to be in the field for a long period of time to achieve impact. Uh, another in interesting aspect that, I, that we, we saw in terms of where the social entrepreneurs in the field are present, most of them, uh, even if they have different activities or different sports that they use, the most important part of what they're doing with their social side, with their social impact activities, they are to uh, on this side of education to sports. How sports can support um, usually um, students, pupils. How support how how the sport supports these these children to develop some skills that might be useful for them in their life. So building life skills. That's kind of where sports is really used. Um, and also it's used a lot in, in, in the inclusion side uh, as a big uh, category. And also uh, we were surprised to see that more initiatives are used for, for elderly to solve problems regarding to elderly. Now let's go to, you know, I would say the juicy side of the challenges that social entrepreneurs in, in sports face in Romania. Of course, we think of this part of financial uh, challenges, infrastructure challenges, but it, it was very interesting to see that most of the people that we interviewed said that the human resources challenges is bigger than the legislative one. I mean, they can deal with the laws that we have, but finding and training and developing human resources who are interested in solving social problems with sports and staying there, it's harder. And we see that, especially when sports is used with vulnerable groups like elderly, like us using sports for inclusion, there in these, um, in these fields, we have bigger issues in terms of the human resources. But for sure, the financial and infrastructure aspects are important. But then what, what's important is that, and I think with that, I'm going to uh, close it down to have questions more from, from your side. What we, what we observed is that People who are staying in the field for a longer period of time, they see the need of having better equipped social resources because they can deal with the infrastructure. They can even do some uh, changes in terms of infrastructure or in terms of uh, financial resources. But uh, where there's a big lack uh, of, uh, you know, and the challenge is the human resources. 
And another important aspect, which is really, you know, I would say specific to Romania, is that for people who want to develop themselves with change makers, the social entrepreneurs in the field of sports in Romania, they are faced with a mindset and a, a cultural um, bias and gap that it's, you know, a, an obstacle for them because they usually come with new ideas, they propose innovations, which are which are, uh, you know, they, they face the world when they propose something like that. So for early stage social entrepreneurs, the biggest problem is the mindset and the culture that we have when we think about sport being used as a tool for social change. And it's something that people who stayed for a longer period of time, they found ways to dealt with this, with this solution. Uh, and just to give you an example of how this uh, network looked like in the end, this is the map of Connect connections that they have um, uh, among them. For me personally, uh, this exercise was really useful to understand was the people's perception about the field of, uh, the, of sports being used as a tool to produce social change. And I think it's a conversation that's important, that's starting to have place, and I think it's going to happen even more. But it's still hard for people to identify themselves as social entrepreneurs or as change makers in the field of sport. And I think this is something that, uh, you know, at least in Romania, there's something that we we have to to work on because there are plenty of people who already do great job, but they just need to have this mentality of being social entrepreneurs and perceive themselves as that. And I will now just give the floor, you know, if there are questions, I think I'm okay with the time. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> Mihai briefed me well to be sharp and crisp. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. I can also send to you afterwards, you know, the full presentation and the website when you, where you can actually go and see some examples of social entrepreneurs. But I would be curious to see if there are any questions from your side. Mihai, you're on mute. Thank you for the presentation and for letting me know that I'm on mute. Um, I'm interested in the subject and together with uh, the students, I, I did some research um, related to social entrepreneurship in sports, but I have to confess that um, the, the mapping exercise that Shoka did was really um, revealing a, a, a much larger phenomenon than, than expected before. So again, thank you for helping us uh, having a better understanding of the, um, the limits of the, the amplitude actually of the phenomenon in, in Romania. Um, questions, if you have for a video. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Maxim. Okay, Maxim. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting to listen what uh, Ashoka in Romania is doing. I was wondering if any other uh, country Ashuk representatives are doing similar research or is it your Romanian initiative do you, I know I, I, I would say that this type of mapping that we do for sports is the first one that we do in you know in Ashoka because we because I wanted to do that in Romania we don't have we didn't have such a knowledge and we needed this kind of mapping to do anything the map as an exercise of Mapping, yes, we in Ashoka we do it when we want to understand the field, specific field. But in terms of sport, no, it's not something that we do. I have a colleague in Poland that you know he recently joined Ashoka and he has an interest in sport. But because it's such a particular field, uh, usually uh, if you have an interest uh, in this field, then you're going to develop something. And because in Ashoka you don't have so many people interested specifically on this field, then they are. I mean, they don't have the expertise or the knowledge to understand how this kind of mapping would work and why would they do it? Because for example, we didn't do the mapping just to understand the field. We wanted to use it as a tool to build something because we're going to launch a program for the change maker. So it's on a longer term, not only to map what's happening. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of Choka, I think in Romania is the In uh, in Shokine, Ashoka Romania is the only one that did, but I think uh, you know there will be some others interested in some sort of kind of uh, uh, tools. But Maxim, where are you located? We are in Norway. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, guys, uh, thank you for um, again um, your comments and and uh, video for the presentation. 
Um, I would like to go further now um, presenting an as famous as Ashoka probably um, an organization uh, talking about Special Olympics and about um, the representative of the Romanian branch of Special Olympics, um, Emilia Ispas, which is about to give us a presentation on uh, what they are doing here in Romania. So, um, Emilia, would you like to have the floor? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mihai. Thank you for having us. Um, we are honored to be here. I will uh, start my presentation by sharing my uh, screen and uh, starting my timer. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, about uh, about uh, Special Olympics uh, Romania, we Emilia, uh, could you enlarge. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we work in Romania since two thousand three, and uh, we implement programs for uh, children and uh, youth and adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, we have a national program uh, that involved over uh, 20,000 uh, at uh, 20,000 athletes uh, since uh, 2003 in uh, competition uh, type events all over Romania. Uh, and we at Special Olympics Romania and at Special Olympics International, we believe in the transformative power of sports. Uh, we have uh, sports as a motor and as a tool, as a vector, if you want, of changing attitudes and mentalities amongst those who participate. Um, and here I talk about athletes, volunteers, coaches, uh, and mainstream public. Um, in Special Olympics, uh, we think that uh, every athlete with intellectual disabilities has the right to feel a champ, to feel and to act like a real champion, uh, like a champion of, um, of those who uh, train and who uh, who um, work uh, work with them. Uh, that's why Special Olympics de uh, developed a special uh, tool, which is called divisioning. And by this tool, we evaluate all our athletes uh, and uh, we uh, organize competitions um, uh, according to the level of abilities of all our athletes. Um, in the end, uh, all our athletes um, uh, uh, participating in a sports event have the chance to be on the podium, uh, to go through a podium protocol, to be awarded, to be cheered by those who come to see, uh, to see them and to admire them. Um, as all organizations that work with people with uh, disabilities, we believe in the unlimited potential of our athletes. We believe in their abilities and we focus on developing their abilities. Uh, abilities that might be sports abilities, that are uh, social abilities, that we think sports help them uh, develop. Um, the unified sports concept is a, a simple and a very powerful concept that we use in Special Olympics. Uh, we bring youth, children, adults with and without intellectual disabilities. We put them on the field, on the, on the pitch, and we train them and we uh, organize um, competitions for them. Uh, they, uh, they play in the same team, so they do not play uh, one against uh, each other. They play together as a team. Uh, this being a concept that brings uh, joy, uh, new social skills, and positive attitudes uh, um, um, 
for the players, but also for the staff and for the, those uh, surrounding uh, our uh, players. Uh, we uh, we uh, name um, uh, uh, our athletes with intellectual disabilities Special Olympics athletes in uh, in a unified team, and the players are their partners. Um, <clears throat> Here uh, uh, we uh, we I, I, we wanted to to show you uh, the segreg segregated uh, model uh, of engaging in sports, where we have um, uh, teams uh, formed uh, uh, mainstream teams for people without disabilities, and um, uh, the classical model of Special Olympics, where there are in a team only athletes with uh, with disabilities. The uniform sports uh, component brings uh, inclusion, uh, brings people together, uh, having them, uh, um, uh, offering them the opportunity to train and uh, play together as a team. Um, this concept that we also implement in, uh, in Romania since uh, 2005, um, uh, um, brings uh, uh, brings the, the idea of, uh, of inclusion on the first uh, step of the podium and um, the culture inside the unified sports uh, will have uh, will stress the idea of personal development of uh, inclusive and, un uh, and equal connections between players and uh, and brings uh, people uh, closer um, we we organize events in uh, basketball, football. These are uh, team games. Uh, we also organize a unified events for racket games where they play uh, double in badminton, in tennis. We unified teams, uh, athletes with and without uh, disabilities uh, pairing. Uh, and also, uh, we developed um, a system of scoring um, uh, athletes with and uh, partners uh, without disabilities um, train and uh, participate in athletics, boxing, or gymnastics, gaining points uh, for their team. Um, this year, we started to implement uh, more um, uh, this type of unified uh, activities in schools and um, and uh, together with our partners, uh, NGOs and mainstream schools, uh, we aim uh, bringing um, uh, Special Olympics unified uh, sports in mainstream school environments. Uh, we consider that uh, sports can bring joy uh, in school, uh, can, um, uh, can um, 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 make uh, children from, uh, from uh, mainstream school uh, uh, to be closer to the athletes, to be more open-minded, more tolerate, uh, tolerant. Uh, as you may know, in Romania, the, the education system being segregated. We have children in main, uh, mainstream schools and uh, children with disabilities in special schools. So by this project, we want to, uh, bring, uh, to bring the athletes in in the fields of the mainstream schools and to, to give them the opportunity to train and play against, uh, uh, together with, uh, with, uh, with the children uh, from, uh, from our schools. Please conclude. Uh, Please conclude. Uh, yes, this is my, uh, my last uh, slide and I uh, wait uh, for your uh, comments. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer. We implemented this program uh, in two counties now, in Bucharest and in Hunedoara. And we organized a unified fitness uh, championship, a virtual, a virtual event, uh, which was quite challenging for us in these times. But uh, still, we had uh, over 300 athletes and partners uh, competing and sending us uh, films uh, with exercises. And this way, we were able to to, uh, to award them um, medals and uh, create virtual podiums. 
and um, it was quite interesting to see how uh, how things uh, went uh, on these uh, on these uh, unusual uh, times. <laughs> so um, um, okay, so uh, probably everybody knows about um, Special Olympics. It's a global brand. Um, if you have any questions related to the content of the presentation, to what Special Olympics is doing in, in Romania, now is the time. Right. Um, okay. Um, then I, I would like to ask Emilia if um, similar um, or the, the, the projects in Romania, are they um, tailored for the Romanian reality or are they um, common with some other branches in different other countries? So, of course, we, we follow the, the Special Olympics uh, International General Sports Rooms uh, rules and programming, but all our projects, all the projects we implement in Romania, of course, they are tailored to our realities. Uh, Special Olympics implements more than 32 sports for uh, people with, disab with intellectual disabilities, while uh, in our country we only uh, have um, 15 sports. Uh, last year we added uh, speed skating, uh, artistic uh, skating and uh, roller skating, which was quite, uh, quite uh, a challenge for us. Um, and uh, yes, to answer your question, uh, yes, all our programs are tailored to, to the realities in, uh, in Romania. And uh, this is how it should be. We cannot uh, implement uh, a project without uh, thinking to, to adapt uh, to, to what's happening in, in our country. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if, Thank you. Uh, um, if it's okay with you, we can go to the next presentation, which is uh, made by Cristina Bala from um, the STEA Association. STEA means star in Romania. So, Cristina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will uh, start my presentation. I hope you uh, can hear me well. Uh, so, uh, I'm very pleased to present you um, the result of an exceptional project that we did last year for a whole year. Um, we are uh, an NGO working in the social field with the Roma vulnerable community. And uh, we had the chance through an EU-funded uh, cross-border project to partner up with um, a chess club from uh, Hungary. Uh, in order to put together our experience. And uh, we really experienced that uh, sport is uh, a community builder. And uh, the aim of uh, our activity was to develop uh, social inclusion opportunities of vulnerable children in the cross-border area using chess, both as personal development tool and the mean to create a positive interaction uh, between vulnerable groups and other community members. The, the target group uh, that we worked with last year was composed of um, 100 children, 70% uh, of them uh, being uh, children from uh, Roma vulnerable communities, both in Romania and in Hungary. And um, I will explain uh, you that uh, we managed to involve other 300 children and uh, several adults from non-vulnerable background in uh, joint activities. So the main idea was, uh, as uh, you can see in my uh, presentation, that we uh, were uh, three NGOs in the beginning working together. Uh, so uh, there is a STIA with uh, a background in social work, uh, a chess club from Satumare in Romania, and uh, another organization in Hungary having both sides, so uh, a chess performance, but also working uh, with chess, but uh, for vulnerable children. We put together our ideas, our experience, in order to, to build something uh, tailored to the needs of the children. 
And from our uh, cooperation, uh, we managed to put together the chess activities with life skills development activities, which uh, our social worker have uh, an ex extensive experience to, to implement. And uh, the idea was that we were able to work on, on three main components. So life skills development uh, throughout educational activities, increasing uh, self-esteem of the children by winning experiences through the game of chess. And uh, also we work on a very important dimension of reducing discrimination. Uh, because uh, working with uh, real uh, chess uh, playing um, clubs, we were able to make uh, ch real chess, international chess competition. We also uh, did uh, camps and uh, trip excursion between uh, children from vulnerable and non-vulnerable background. And uh, a lot of open days events inviting uh, member, members from the local community to connect uh, with our experience and to participate. Uh, the main uh, ideas of our methodology are resumed here. Uh, we build a strategy based on motivating the children. The children is seen as our partner in the process of uh, own development. Uh, we start with a complex assessment of the children's need, uh, also interest and expectations in order to continuously adapt uh, our uh, proposal of activities uh, to the child. And we use interactive and very experiential uh, method and component and uh, child-centered learning strategy. Uh, you can see in our pictures, uh, some of uh, them are pictures from the chess competition that we made that were open to all public. Um, and uh, also a picture from the chess camp, uh, which was an, uh, a very good experience where children from a vulnerable background with other children uh, could spend uh, a whole week together bonding. Uh, the results were fantastic because uh, the children from non-vulnerable families um, came to this uh, activity having some prejudice. Uh, so uh, the, the parents were scared to let their children uh, participate to this camp. And in the end of the camp, uh, the children from non-vulnerable background bonded so well with, with the other children that they ask their parents to become volunteers uh, in working, uh, in continuing working with our children in our day center. Uh, the main idea was to connect chess activities with life skills activities and uh, the hundred children had uh, chess training twice a week, but also other kind of uh, educational activities focusing on four main domains. So cognitive and learning skills, social and uh, relationship skills, emotional skills and self-knowledge, and uh, independent living skills uh, in order to become um, as autonomous as possible. Within the project, we were able to build a guide uh, that we, we propose to share with other interested uh, professionals. And uh, also we build a tool in order to evaluate the progress of the children, both vulnerable and non-vulnerable uh, background, uh, children coming from both backgrounds. And uh, here I present some of the results uh, that we obtain with vulnerable children in STEA Association. And uh, as you can see, there is uh, an important difference between the stage one, which is represented by the red line, and the, the final stage uh, after one year, the blue one. We have more than 10%, 10 um, uh, they evolve more than 10% in uh, those uh, eight main areas that we focused on. So hygiene skill, understanding the task, attention and motivation, self-control and patience, communication and interactions, um, assuming tasks and responsibilities, behavior towards adults and uh, behavior among uh, children. Uh, for us, the most important results uh, are uh, focused here. So we managed uh, to build a project, a program that is really helping us to prevent school dropouts and increasing school frequency. 
uh, these children uh, um, in a matter of uh, eight months were able to participate in real chess competition. Uh, they were able to have um, a really positive experience of winning, uh, which uh, helped us a lot to motivate them and encourage them to, to follow their educational um, path. Uh, so um, there were also improved results in uh, the cognitive skills evaluation and uh, we, can, we could see the positive uh, changes in the behavior of these children. Uh, so uh, we were able to build and we are continuing to use uh, some tested solution to reduce gap in self-esteem and life skills development from children uh, coming from different backgrounds uh, and thus uh, promoting equal opportunities for all children and, uh, and uh, fighting against discrimination of the vulnerable groups. Uh, we have been creating please, please conclude, opportunities to, to, to enable these children to have positive uh, interaction and uh, the results are really fantastic. Um, I will conclude here. Uh, we are a small organization and uh, since last year we are continuing to implement uh, these activities which help us a lot to, to sustain the motivation of these children. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, as you can see, impressive um, results um, in a community. Um, and obviously there, there, there are um, many other communities which would need such kind of intervention, let's call it this way, as um, sociologists uh, uh, would call them. Um, I wonder if you have any questions uh, related to the presentation. I have a question, and it's more about the, if we think of the categories of, of children that you work with, if there's any difference in terms of um, how the process applies to them, depending on the community that they come from, either if it's, you know, a community in terms of uh, the region that they come for or in terms of ethnicity, you know, if there, if you noticed any, any differences in terms of the context where you apply this methodology. Uh, so it, it was very interesting because uh, this project enabled us to work together with uh, Hungarian partners who are working exactly with another similar Roma vulnerable community and the, the, we compare the results and the results show uh, very significant, significant um, similarities in the results that we obtained. So in Romania and in Hungary, we obtained uh, almost the same uh, type of uh, uh, evolution of the children. And in both cases, we paid a lot of attention to uh, bring together uh, both kinds of children, so children from vulnerable and non-vulnerable uh, communities. And between the, these two categories, there are differences uh, because the starting point of uh, when we evaluated their skills, there was really a big uh, difference uh, between uh, the skills of these two groups of children. So yes, there are, the, um, there are differences in, in the results of obtained by uh, vulnerable and non-vulnerable children. And in the, in the non-vulnerable children, um, we really see a change of, of how they approach and how they, they communicate with, with these children. And these non-vulnerable children became change agents in their families um, in order to let them uh, be friends with uh, children coming from Roma communities. So I think there is a lot of potential in this field to change mentalities by creating direct opportunities to do something uh, positive together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Somebody else we interested in, in, in commenting or asking questions to Christina? I think that um, it, it's a great opportunity to have um, also some practitioners um, in, 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 in the event as participants. Uh, obviously, um, the, the reach of information 
um, it's it's much bigger. While uh, we have concrete um, practice experiences related in in um, the event, um, we should continue then with the next presentation, um, the last one in um, this workshop, which is about um, the reality check um, association presenting their project uh, by uh, Simona Ilash Cruze. Mm -hmm. Now. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Congratulations for the presentations. Um, I will share my screen. I hope it will work. Mm -hmm. One second. Okay. Can you see a photo with some kids and a young girl? <laughs> okay. Um, these are the kids from Castello. This is uh, a 5,000 uh, people community close to the Black Sea in Constanza County, Romania. Um, and Cristina is uh, our local coordinator. Um, few words about our organization. Reality Check was founded three years ago by a group of people with uh, big experience in social projects, field projects, fighting poverty. And as a novelty from what we've done before, we want to document our work and to propose changes for the policies that have to do with poverty. We had some success, but on a different direction on early education. And um, I think, um, you might know this graphic, you might not. Um, yesterday I was happy. I found something relevant for my presentation because this says a lot uh, that Romania is the first at, uh, the first country in the talk of having children at risk of poverty. But then I thought it was, it's actually very bad news, but it's a news that lasts for some while. So yeah, we have many, many kids we have 200,000 kids that they go hungry to bed every evening. And um, with these kids, we work. Um, we work in two communities intensively and we took a long-term um, responsibility for these people. And Castello is one of them. As I said, 5,000 5, people, um, a bit over a thousand living in severe poverty and 650 of them are children. Um, the children are discriminated, they are not welcome to school and kindergarten. Uh, the parents, most of them have no education and the only jobs they can do is to collect garbage and sell it and they can barely offer food and a roof to their children. Um, it's, uh, I've been there with another organization in this community like over seven years ago. It's a tough community because the, um, um, the school doesn't, doesn't want these children there and we are working on it. And I've, we came up with this idea with the sports, which I think it brought a lot. Um, um, and because we believe that we really have to bring together these two words. The Romania that work talks to you like this from in front of such a screen and with headphones in English and the Romania of this child sitting on the floor and having almost no chance, no chance to a decent life. Uh, the specific problem of the uh, Castello communities is also that this community, um, it's a mixture of Turkish and Roma ethnicity. That means they have some Turkish traditions, but, but their language is a mix of uh, Ro Romani and Turkish. So, and they are not recognized uh, neither by the Romanian or by Turkish community or Roma. So they are, they belong to nobody kind of. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, it's also difficult for them to integrate once they come to school. 
because they cannot really talk the language. And yeah, and um, we have also some educational initiatives there and um, a health program. And uh, three years ago, we had our first big running event involving like 350 children. This was with the small funding from Kaufland, Romania, which is one of the most, I would say, I mean, they are, they are really, I think, making a change in terms of social, corporate social responsibility, but this is a parenthesis. Okay, and then um, uh, the next year, we had a bigger program, which involved also this event, but we also had routine sports activities for 400 children. And we also involved parents, and we also had some personal development through adventure camps where we, yeah, tried to, 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 to bring up in the mind of the children that these ideas that they can do it, that uh, they have to trust themselves to address uh, also these things that they were learning through sports, like having a routine. Uh, there was a big problem to have all these kids on time. Uh, because they don't have this exercise to have a, an agenda outside of the school. They don't really, I mean, it was difficult to make them understand how important it is that they come on time. So it took some time, I don't know, like two months, we were still going in the community from door to door, or we were writing the hour, and they were be spread through the school and so on. But uh, it did them amazingly good. And uh, all the activities were, uh, in all the activities we wanted to bring together also the so-called so Romanian children and these children from the very poor community that I was mostly talking about right now. Um, it was mentioned before also, yes, this is a very big plus. If you have the majority parents leaving their children playing with the other children, that's a big success. Um, and, um, and we saw that, I mean, yes, I also believe, and uh, we will develop this. We are, we want to, we piloted this in one uh, village and now we have a project over two years and there we also included sport activities. And um, yeah, it's a great way to address discrimination and to include the children who are excluded. Um, yeah, the advantages. Um, yeah, and the, 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 maybe the main objective was to give them the community, the feeling that they are all one community regardless of poor, rich, Turkish, Roma, Romanian, whatever. Yeah. Um, I also have a short video. Um, I will try to start it one second. Mm. Yeah. Is it working? The video? Yeah. No? No. No. No? No. But I think I, I think you need to stop share screening and then share screening again. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see. Mm -hmm. mm, share screen. Uh-huh. working now. There is no sound. No sound? Well, it's... When, when you share screen, there's an option to share with sound. And I think it you didn't select it. Scuse. Uh, deci când dau share screen, 
Share someone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scuze. Thank you, video. Da, mersi mult. Aici era. Ok. Mm. No, îmi cere niște chestii pe aici. Um, sorry. Um, Lia, looks like this computer is asking me for some setting up if I want to share my audio. Mihai, should they start? Should they try from your computer? Do you have it? Mm, I can. I can the, the link is online. Actually, what you can do, Simona, if can you we? wish, you can, you can share it on the chat. I don't know if, and, and then we can see it. Either, yeah, that would be great. Either simultaneously, that, that would be fine. Each of us can play. Uh, us. It's 11 of us, so that's fine. Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty big file, and with English subtitles, I, I unfortunately. Oh, okay, I so you don't. But, okay, uh, so you have it on your mind. laptop. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, no, no, I thought it was online. I have it with I have it in Romanian. I mean the words are uh, the images are more important. I think I will do that. But Mihai, do you have it on your computer? Yes. Uh, but I need some just one second. Uh, I need to start it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Workshop. I need to start it. I just no no not this one not this one. Uh, that's the. Yeah, that's yours. Can you see it, huh? Anatoly, can you mute yourself? Рада очень была видеть. Михай, я думаю, что у тебя есть возможность умить людей. Ой, ладно. Mergeam și renunțam. Între timp s-a creat un fel de automatism. Ei deja știu când sunt antrenamentele. Vin cu mare dragă aici, chiar cu o oră înainte și așteaptă până să ajungem noi la sala de sport. Let's go, Shiva. 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 Let's go, Shiva.
Okay, I hope that you got it. She, uh, it was also interrupted for you also, not only for me, or? Um, I was sharing the whole video. I don't know if you have seen it. No. See, I've seen it, but I think the, yeah, I, uh, the quality was unfortunately bad by watching it so now in the, with us together on Zoom. Otherwise, it should be a nice. Okay. But anyway. Thank you, Simona, for sharing this. Um, it's always so dramatic to see um, how many realities are in the same country, in the same um, European Union. I would, I would also um, taking the political stand. Um, but also, um, just from a human um, kind perspective, looking to how people around us um, they need they, they need our support and how important our involvement would be. Again, thank you, Simona, for sharing this. Guys, if you have any comments, no. No comments. Can you hear me? Okay, great, super. Um, this was the last presentation um, during the that domestic session, and um, as mentioning before, it's it's always. Um, very emotional to see how um, people um, around us um, are suffering, um, but in the same time, it's so impressive to see how other people can can um, change the status of those communities. Obviously, those guys. I really like the, the. It was in the middle of the video. I, I don't know if you noticed. It was a, a little boy saying, "This was the best day of my life." <laughs> I saw that. This was so nice. I always enjoyed this remark. I, I, I've seen, seen the, the video a couple of times, but this is my favorite. The guy saying that this is my, the best day of my life. Um, so this was the last presentation. And I'm pretty sure that, that there are a lot of um, other projects which are um, as impressive as uh, the, the, the last two you have seen dealing with local communities. Um, and I think that it's very important for us, um, coming from the academic sector, to give them a voice, to give them a voice to present um, those kind of projects in, in our communities, in a larger perspective. And if possible, helping, um, I don't know, just by informing or um, creating um, environments or frameworks where they can join, they can cooperate, they can, um, they can create some synergies in the activities they do because they, I, I think that they are all of them champions, but um, they, they need also um, some support. Yeah, um, I would like to add something, uh, okay. if possible, one word. Um, this is something very specific, but I think it's very relevant. I want to say that Castelu, which has this huge uh, poor community, they also have an amazing sport building. It's huge. It's like it was built up with European funds. It's I think it's ha so half of the village. It's huge. They weren't using it. It was closed. Nobody thought, let's do something for these children there. It's amazing. It's like so somehow you can find resources. It's not with human resource, it's difficult. But uh, look at this, I mean, it's mind blowing. So sometimes uh, maybe the things are in there, the need is there, you have, we had this very nice guy. He was talking in the video, he was a foot, the football trainer. 
he was he also lived in the village so he was there the kids were there the sport uh how do you say in english sport hall i mean um sport, the, sport hall the sport hall was sport there hall. but no nobody thought to put these things together yeah so luckily you you got there and you you managed to, to do something yeah Pretty but this is this is one or two or three but i don't know yeah okay that's all okay guys um so we we should uh, we should conclude our our meeting uh we should conclude the, the domestic session but also we should conclude the, the whole event um and uh, probably it would be nice to ask uh, my colleagues uh, being involved in the organizing of the, the event, Daniel and Rocio, um, if you would like to say um, a closing word here. Well, I mean, I, I think since I didn't have the, uh, the chance to thank you personally, you know, those of you who are in the table, in the round table, the closing round table, I was just exchanging with Mihai, actually. For me, it's always so exciting to hear firsthand what is happening. Um, at the same time, it comes back the, the recurring question eh, that was also raised this morning, you know, like why should, why are we researching this field, you know, why should there be any interest and, and, and what's the purpose? Well, the one thing that I've learned, you know, doing what I do and trying to work with policymakers, as, as Simona just said, I mean, the, the way that for many years things have been done, policies have been created, uh, budgets have been spent without taking into consideration, you know, the, the voices and the needs of the citizens. I think that we've seen a lot of that, you know. So one of the reasons that I always, you know, like to, to emphasize as to why should practitioners and researchers, assuming that that difference in itself is not that clear cut, but why, why should we collaborate? For me, it's clear. I mean, it's, we, we can shape, we do shape the form that policies take. Uh, more and more often, uh, policymakers know that they have to be accountable to different instances. Citizens are one of them, but then also European bodies, international bodies, et cetera, et cetera. And what I've learned is that this dialogue between policy and research, I mean, I'm sorry, between practice and research does have a huge impact on policy while reinforcing as well how we do things and, you know, on the academy side also um, helping us understand how the world functions. So thank you so much. It was really, really exciting. I've had a chance to actually, we're quite familiar at MS with the work of, of some of your organizations. We are collaborators with some of them. And it's not the first time that we go to Romania, although not physically, but I felt in Romania for the last hour. So thank you so much. Really, really thank you for taking the time. I know how time is important for you. So I really, really appreciate that you devoted that time to us. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah. And, I, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I um I would also like to launch an invitation when this craziness, this corona is you can you are welcome to come and see the things at the field level in Castel. <laughs> Simona, yeah. you you know we all, we actually do take up invitations. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So don't don't be surprised. Don't be okay. surprised okay. when we knock on your doors. Done. Do yeah. It. Yeah. You might and see we how people planning. come there to do some team buildings and all the stuff. Yeah. And we were planning to be in Romania right now and we already did some things in, in Romania. I feel very welcome. Uh, welcome there by uh, great efforts of Mihai and other, other uh, people who, who welcome us in, on several occasions. I also want to thank you all for participation, for starting conversation in, in this field for uh, giving us great examples uh, that, that show us that we can do some good and that made us think how we can explore this further, how can we find out more and how can we give back to the practice for, uh, for shaping new, uh, new areas of social impacts in, in fields of social entrepreneurship and sports. 
and uh, in front of the Empower SC co-station, uh, which is co-organizing co this seminar, I think that this was one of the preliminary attempts to address you know, existing gaps in knowledge in, in this field. And uh, I think that our you know, hum humble, ha more, little more than half a day gathering of us, you know, baby, baby Zoomers in this new environment will uh, we'll take home, you know, uh, birth of new collaboration, you know, new research ideas, we will all exchange information. And I really hope uh, continue to communicate and more importantly, think and uh, do some, uh, some good. So thank you, thank you once again, uh, all uh, for participation. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah, everybody have a good weekend. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you so much as well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hi bye, Daniel. Bye, Sam. Bye, Mika. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. So it's okay. only so it's only us. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Why, why have you been here signed up twice? I don't know. Because ah, you gave the, the link to someone. Yeah, I gave link to, yeah. <laughs> so that's no, twice. I, I, I sent the link only to Mihai, so maybe he's twice here. So that's yeah. why there are two Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, but, but that, uh, I was that, wondering too, if you can imagine, while me being one of the Daniels, I was wondering why Daniel is twice there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What so that's said. why. I will try to, to send a message to myself. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it's, it's, I mean, I'm exhausted and I haven't even been, you know, like really taking notes or anything. But it's been, it's been, wow.